Namaste and good afternoon, everyone. I am Ritika Gupta, Assistant Director at Infri Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabha Vivam Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi. Extend my heart. Yes, welcome to you all to Infri Hashtag The Policy Talk. Today we are here for a panel discussion on rural realities in Kerala. practitioners experiences in tackling the second wave in indian villages this discussion is being organized by center for habitat urban and regional studies at impri along with international institute of migration and development in kerala i would now like to request dr simi mehta who is ceo and editorial director at impri to introduce our eminent panelists for the ma'am over to you thank you thank you ritika and good afternoon to everyone I hope you, you, your loved ones, and everyone around you are staying safe and healthy. As the second wave of COVID nineteen rages across the country and engulfs the rural spaces, this time, since the start of this month, Impri has been organizing statewide discussions to understand the practitioners' perspectives on the rural realities. Uh, so far, we have held discussions for the states of Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Gujarat, Rajasthan, Bihar, Jharkhand, Odisha. Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, Assam, Meghalaya, Tripura, Sikkim, Arunachal Pradesh, Mizoram, Nagaland, Manipur, Uttar Pradesh, uh, Punjab, and Haryana. Today, we will discuss the rural realities with the practitioners of Kerala. We are very privileged and fortunate to have a very eminent panel of uh, um, experts who would be talking about the rural realities of Kerala. So, I'll not take much time, and I'll introduce to you our expert panelists. Uh, the chair for the session is dr nivedita haran she is retired as additional chief secretary department of home affairs government of kerala and is the honorary chairperson on the center for uh, migration and inclusive development cmid kerala uh, the moderator for the session is professor irudaya rajan he was formerly professor at center for development studies kerala and currently he is a chairman of the international institute of migration and development kerala our panelists are dr shriram venkati raman he is the joint secretary in the in the government of kerala health and family welfare department uh, we have with us professor vinoj abraham he is professor at the center for development studies kerala we have with us mr reni k jacob he is legal consultant with international justice mission we have with us mr t m satyan he is the coordinator kerala of action aid association we have with us mr john samuels he is the former international director action aid india action aid association and as discussants to the program we have dr dilip devakar he is assistant professor in the department of social work central university of kerala and dr shrinath namudiri he is assistant professor chinmaya vidyapeet arnakulam so uh, thank you so much for uh, this uh, panel discussion that we are going to have and i invite professor irudaya rajan to take the session forward welcome sir and over to you irudaya sir you are on mute please kindly unmute yes please thank you simi yes. and thank you uh, everyone for uh, participating in this particular uh, event on kerala practitioners experiences in tackling the second wave in indian villages and uh, before I, i i speak anything i thought i will ask uh, chair to make a few statement before we open up for the uh, uh, impri to put their video for 2 to 3 minutes uh, dr navida please thank you professor rajun uh, thank you uh, professor rajun and the team at impri it's a pleasure to be associated with you all uh, let me begin by Uh, expressing my appreciation for this series of uh, talks that you have arranged on each state and the experiences sharing by the uh, ground level workers so to speak i think it's a wonderful idea and the fact that you're getting them together to share their experiences and i'll presently maybe at the end of it when i make my remarks I, that is one of the points i'd like to emphasize upon what we need during these times is to talk to each other which really uh, if you are in the field you don't have the time to do it and those who are not in the field are probably too remote to do it and therefore that impri has been doing this i was very pleasantly surprised 
uh, when as I was recovering from my uh, stint of uh, COVID, uh, I'm out of it now, uh, hopefully. Uh, I realized that and when I got this message from Professor Rajan asking me to attend, I thought that was very ironic. And it was also extremely topical. So uh, full marks to you all for that. Uh, Professor Rajan, I'll keep my comments for later because I would like to listen to all the speakers and then I would want to probably sum up and make my comments. So once again, it's a pleasure and thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Naveda. Now we will go for the video of the video made by uh, uh, video made by the uh, the team. Yes, yes, yes. Sir. Yeah, please go so, ahead. Yeah. Yes. So our team has prepared a, a short snapshot of the uh, cases of the coronavirus pandemic pertaining to various technical details, including vaccination, uh, just to have our attention on the state in respect of the numbers so that uh, we finish off with the quantitative things and get into the qualitative things. And as our chair highlighted, that is the purpose of this deliberation. So uh, Swati will do the presentation. Swati, are you ready? Yes, sir, ready. Uh, you, uh, please share the screen. Over to you, Swati. Yeah, thank you, sir. Namaskaram. I am Swati Solanki, a researcher at IMPRI and pursuing my graduation from Sri Ram College of Commerce. Today, we all have gathered here for a panel discussion on rural realities, Kerala, practitioners' experiences in tackling the second wave in Indian villages. The maps here are of Kerala, which is situated in the southwestern end of the Indian subcontinent. It is a long history of art and cultural heritage and foreign trade with other countries. The state with the highest literacy rate in India is noted for its achievement in education, health, gender equality, law, and order. In addition to these, the state has the lowest infant mortality rate in the country. Before the independence of India, Kerala was one of the princely states in India. The state was formed on 1 November 1956. Kerala lies between the Arabian Sea in the west and Western Ghats in the east, with an area of 38,863 square kilometer. It is one of the five states in the linguistic cultural area known as South India. The neighboring states of Kerala are Tamil Nadu and Karnataka and also surrounds Mahi, a segment of the Union Territory of Puducherry on the northwest coast. The capital of the state is Tiruvananthapuram, formerly known Trivandrum. For administrative purposes, the state is divided into 14 revenue districts, namely Tiruvananthapuram, Kolam, Allapura, Patanthita, Kottayan, Iduki, Ernakulam, Trishur, Palakat, Malampuram, Koikot, uh, Vayanadu, Kannur, and Vasargod. The sum of uh, some of the prominent personalities of Kerala are R. Narayan, S. Shridhan, and Arundhati Roy, to name a few. The tropical climate and the rich monsoons offer beautiful landscapes, presence of abundant water bodies, long beaches, and more than 40 rivers add to the charm, making Kerala popular by the name of God's own country. In terms of the economy, remittances in Kerala from, from the Gulf countries contribute to nearly one-fourth of Kerala's national state domestic product. Coming to the socio-economic indicators, about 52% 52, 52 of the total population resides in rural areas. In terms of sex ratio and literacy rate, Kerala has achieved commendable heights. In terms of the progress made in SDG goals, Kerala is ranked first among the Indian states and union territories and eighth in terms of per capita income. The first and the second wave of the coronavirus has hit India very badly and Kerala has been no exception. When the first nationwide uh, wide lockdown was imposed, there were a lot of issues faced by migrant workers and consequently, government had also been trying to reach out to them through transportation services like one day Bharat flights isolation facilities, and income support measures. As you can see, the first wave of uh, the pandemic had its peak on 16 September 2020, and Kerala has been a major contributor to the number of cases. Now, there have been different events adding to the COVID-19 cases, including migration, festivities, and local and state elections. During the uh, COVID-19 second wave, as on 14th May 2021, Kerala has recorded about 20 lakh cases and about 6,000 deaths. 
Kerala faces the greatest strain in as any state has seen so far and has also ramped up its testing. Looking at the district-wise uh, district distribution of cases in Kerala, we can see that states, uh, that districts like Kasargo, Kannur, Vainadu, they have contributed to a large number of COVID-19 cases in Kerala. Seeing the rising number of cases in the country, various states have extended curbs in fighting against the COVID, and so has Kerala. The vaccination drive in Kerala was launched on 16 January 2021. The first priority group has been healthcare and frontline workers, and the second age priority groups have been 16 people above 16 years of age and persons between 45 and 59 years with comorbid conditions. As of 15 May 2021, about 82 lakh people have been vaccinated in Kerala. There has been emerging issues in the state of Kerala. Vaccination is one among them. So Kerala has decided to purchase one crore doses of vaccine directly from the manufacturers. The age group of 18 to 45 years has remained a non-starter because of low stock of vaccines and the priority has been shifted to people above 45 age group. Oxygen, uh, in terms of oxygen, there has been rising demand for medical oxygen in the state which has more than doubled, but experts say that Kerala is well prepared to meet the demand by augmenting production besides arranging supplies from outside. In terms of health infrastructure and manpower, so well, the, Kerala has a well-developed infrastructure and the role of frontline workers has played a key role in fighting against the pandemic. While increasing the capacity and infrastructure in the hospital is much needed at this point of time, shortage of human resources is emerging as another major problem for which requires immediate attention. Now we look forward to our eminent panelists hearing their views and experiences in tackling the COVID-19 wave in making a happy and prosperous Kerala. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Swati. So with that, yes, you can uh, stop the share. Yes. Uh, with that, we hand over the proceedings to Professor Rajan to take this uh, further. Sir, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Swati, for giving us a brief overview on you know, what about Kerala. Before I ask the first speaker to speak, I want to make basically two statements right now. One is that I was part of the Kerala COVID Management Committee set up by the government of Kerala in the first wave. We are now experiencing the second wave. But if you look at it, Kerala, I think we have to learn some lessons from the first wave to replicate and then reorganize and re-modify whatever policies we had. For example, Kerala's policies of handling the first wave has been talked about by many people. In fact, today, when the Kerala, the same political party is now, you know, taking, uh, you know, oath as the prime, uh, as the chief minister of Kerala, please remember, many of the people were telling us, both directly and indirectly, the way COVID was handled in the first wave by both medical professional and also, for example, community kitchen and then worker camps for the migrants all probably let him probably to come back to even power in the second term because after the 40 years of the Kerala's history, same political party is coming back to power. I think COVID-19 wave one probably has created an atmosphere and also everybody talking about Kerala, even Supreme Court is asking, please follow the Kerala model of how they manage the COVID-19, especially for migrants. So with these remarks, we have several speakers, so we will uh, get some ideas at the, at the later moment. Let me start with uh, first with uh, uh, one of the speaker. I think very important we are getting from somebody from the government who was with uh, both wave one and probably now with wave two, uh, Mr. Sriram Bangatraman, who is currently the joint secretary, Ministry of uh, Health and Family Welfare, Kerala government. Sriram, it is your turn. You can speak for seven to 10 minutes. Can you hear us, Sriram sir? Yes. Yes. yes, yes, please. Please go ahead. Sri Ram, sir, can you hear us? Sri Ram, can you hear us? Ritika, can you ask for yeah. Yeah. Maybe he's on mute. He's speaking, but he's on mute. Maybe. Uh, if if that's Sri, Ram, uh, Sri Ram is not available, shall we move to the next speaker? Then we can bring Sri Ram second round. Yes, yes. We can do that so that we don't I, need to... I will coordinate. Yes, sir. Yeah. 
So let us say, uh, Sri Ram might be, you know, because busy with uh, many other things. So he will be back with us very soon. So we will move to the second speaker, uh, Mr. Renny K. Chakab. Uh, he has worked extensively with the International Justice Mission, and uh, it is your time, Renny. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajan. Am I audible? Yes, please. Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, Dr. Uh, Nivedida, Dr. Arjun, Dr. Derajan, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. John, John Samuel, and all my dear friends and colleagues. I appreciate the initiative of Impact and Policy Research Institute in taking up this particular initiative, starting with different states and coming to Kerala. Uh, special thanks to Swati for her presentation and uh, the special comments made by Dr. Irde Rajan about the government of Kerala. Uh, you may not get uh, many Kerala people attending this program now simultaneously, the swearing in ceremony of the new government is happening now. So people may be interested to see that also. But one comment is, uh, one comment Dr. Irde Rajan said, I like to uh, reiterate, uh, the people of Kerala somehow appreciated the COVID response of the Kerala government. And uh, the clear evidence is that they have allowed the, the, the LDF government to come back. But that was not the usual case in Kerala. It was one after another, the UDF and the LDF. But this time, uh, the second time given to Kerala government seems to be a, a symbol, uh, a token of the appreciation. Uh, as stated in the presentation, uh, the Kerala government health system is better comparative compared to the health systems in other parts of the, uh, the country. Uh, we have uh, committed staff, uh, good governance, uh, vigilant people, and also good uh, convergence between police, health, and panchayat. Uh, last week, uh, the government has fixed the rate for private hospitals, the, the cost for uh, wards, or private rooms and also personal uh, safety equipments, all these are regulated now. So this kind of a control also shows good governance. Let me uh, give you one or two case uh, studies. Uh, like in the first uh, wave, we were thinking something like there is a war happening in, uh, in Israel, for example, but now the second wave, it is in our neighborhood and also in our own homes. I live in a village in Kerala. Uh, it's called uh, Tiruvalla, and my own uh, village is uh, in a remote place. But then uh, I have a few cases around my home. Let me tell you the example of a, of a neighbor. Uh, he's a mechanic. Uh, Sunil, he's a mechanic, and uh, he uh, got symptoms of COVID and his family. And uh, they, he, he only had to connect with his ASHA worker. Uh, because he was having breathing difficulties, immediately the, within an hour, because the ambulance came to my place only, my, my, my street only. And within an hour, ambulance came, he was taken to the hospital and he was, he was taken, he was given good care and he has come back. But meanwhile, his family, his wife and two children were also affected. But interestingly, the Kerala government has the, the free kit, uh, food materials through the ration shops, and also from the panchayat, the panchayat member is, was in touch with him and uh, they provided a uh, free kit with vegetables and all. Uh, from a church, they got uh, some, some uh, materials. The NGOs, uh, they had a voluntary team and the voluntary team was ready. With one phone call, they were ready to bring some medicines or whatever they wanted. So this I have seen uh, in my own, uh, my own neighborhood. Uh, another incident is uh, two people, both of them 80 years old and uh, 75 years old, husband and wife. Uh, they, were, they had comorbidities, but then uh, their children came from uh, abroad and uh, immediately they, uh, they suddenly both of them died with, an, uh, with, a with, a, with a difference of say one hour or so. The entire family was really confused as to what to do and then uh, they were taken to the hospital, uh, but then they were positive, tested positive. There was complete chaos and confusion, but immediately uh, I have seen uh, one political party had a volunteer team. I don't want to mention the name of the political party, but they had a volunteer team 
they came for help the bodies were cremated then it was uh, taken to a burial ground uh, all these were done with the help of uh, uh, youngsters volunteer team with the pp uh, pp kids and uh, it was done properly at the end uh, the family was asking them whether they should give them some money but uh, to my surprise they did not take money from them rather they did it free of course it was a service voluntary service so this kind of uh, ngo support is happening in kerala i represent the international justice mission uh, which is focusing on human trafficking and bond labor but in the present context the number of uh, families uh, the husband and wife father and mother dying and children becoming orphans and uh, the families uh, losing their income the livelihood opportunities may lead to uh, uh, child labor uh, human trafficking bond labor etc uh, not necessarily from kerala as such but kerala being a destination point so many laborers coming to kerala this can happen and uh, ijm as an initiative uh, take up uh, responsibilities working closely with the colleges and also with panchayats in this particular initiative uh, we have an initiative called anti human trafficking clubs uh, by the colleges uh, we have another initiative called panchayat against human trafficking in addition to the human trafficking issues uh, the covid context uh, these uh, clubs are uh, responding properly i am connected with one ngo in a remote uh, place uh, working with dalits and uh, i have seen them working uh, closely with the community the, the dalit communities what they are doing is uh, they are converting a tailoring units uh, into a mask making unit and uh, this become a livelihood opportunity for them and also a hand wash is also being made there and that also is uh, made as a livelihood opportunities so so some of the ngos are doing well uh, connected to the in the context of um, uh, covid in our uh, state and especially in my district most importantly panchayats are working very well uh, the panchayat is uh, very well working closely with kudumbasri kudumbasri is something uh, similar to self help groups and ngos good coordination there is community kitchen food is available nobody should die of hunger is the policy free kit through ration uh, ration shops and volunteer teams are there by religious groups political parties and uh, ngos are having volunteer teams to uh, support uh, the covid uh, affected uh, people uh, in fact uh, there is online uh, youth have started online system in which uh, one phone call you will get all the materials with a with a service charge of 30 rupees and uh, this is much lesser than the auto auto rickshaw charge Uh, of of uh, uh, from from the from the house to get a what auto rickshaw you may have to pay more than 50 rupees but then with 30 rupees they, you may get uh, your items ready in the tribal context uh, uh, there is an ngo working very closely with the ijm they they, are, they have reported that when one or two cases are reported in an ur ur is the village uh, in uh, the tribal uh, village it is called ur and uh, immediately it will be declared as containment zone and the government will provide free food kits and uh, uh, sanitizers and all other uh, needed things through the district uh, disaster management authority that is what ha- what is happening in uh, the villages especially in the the rani uh, just a minute for you because yeah. we are getting uh, yeah. your time is yeah. just a minute yeah i'm close and the, the the challenge is basically the livelihood opportunities the movement is restricted no work for people this is again a challenge but then government is trying to tackle this issue as good as possible but one one important thing is ngos political parties religious organizations are working together as volunteer teams and supporting this initiative whatever is uh, said and done uh, we are happy with the way the government is responding and the number is uh, actually stabilized the death is death rate per day has gone little beyond 100 but it was below 100 all these days we are happy that uh, our government is capable of controlling the death daily death rate in this state uh, thank you very much thank you all thank you thank you so much rani that i think you have emphasized one important point in kerala is the decentralized governance i think that is something very very important i think we have seen that decentralized governance and you given with examples 
Let me move to the next speaker. Is Sriram is available, or I can move to the next speaker? Uh, yes, Doctor Rajan, I'm here. Okay, Sriram, we were called you up. Sriram, that now it is your time. If you have ten minutes to tell us uh, about the uh, experience from the first wave and also you are part of the second wave. Now you are managing. It is your time, Sriram. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Doctor Rajan. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, uh, the organizers for this wonderful opportunity, and also uh, extend my apologies to all of you because. Uh, i could not join you on time so i missed the first couple of speakers uh, i'm presently uh, working as part of the oxygen war room with the secretariat so uh, that is why i had to handle a couple of important phone calls uh, really sorry for that and also uh, special thanks to nivedita ma'am uh, all of us junior officers in the state are huge fans of yours so it's a it's a great uh, blessing for me to finally meet you if not in person at least to zoom because it has become the new normal right now so it is as good as meeting in person so thank you ma'am for uh, everything that you've done and for this opportunity as well so uh, uh, to be very frank it's this is not a very prepared or organized kind of thing that i'm going to do right now because uh, uh, i think i missed a couple of emails from the organizers side so i was not aware of this program and then i got to know of it in the morning but however i thought uh Dr. nevedita ma'am and dr rajan and all of the eminent panelists are here so why not just have a chat with all of you so that is the basic idea that i'm here with and uh, so as far as uh, the uh, so this is called the practitioner's perspectives uh, is what i understand uh, and so you are looking at uh, the various perspectives that people from the field and people handling covid from the front lines uh, have as far as the kerala experience goes uh, so so right from the first wave that happened uh, somewhere last year i have been uh, working as joint secretary of the health and family welfare department government of kerala and uh, as a team all of us have been involved in uh, handling the health aspects of the pandemic like like i'm sure was has been pointed out already this is not a a health department activity or an activity that is focused entirely on uh, the health vertical because this is something that affects every aspect of a human being's life every aspect of society's uh, day to day life so uh, it is only uh, appropriate that all the departments or and rather all stakeholders from society chip in with uh, whatever their their roles and responsibilities are and i think kerala has uh, led by example in that sense where people have managed to come together we proved it even before uh, this pandemic came out during the nipa outbreak during the two years that consecutive years that we had floods in the state we've already proved it kerala is known for the strength and resilience that it Uh, that comes from what uh, dr rajan was mentioning before about the grassroots level decentralized uh, sort of organization structure that the society has in kerala there is uh, it is a very decentralized and uh, you know a bottom up approach that we have for every structure that we have in the state including government so that is probably what came to our rescue that is probably what is our pillar of strength as we go through this pandemic the first wave and the second wave and what not so the government of course has uh, an important role to play in the whole scheme of things like all the other stakeholders have so i can only tell i can tell you most mostly about what the government has been doing or what the government stake uh, uh, on this whole uh, issue is so right from the first wave because i have been engaged with this in a small or a big way the government was uh, the, one of the most important and proactive steps that the government took is to understand that this is going to be big in the future like one year ago one and a half years ago we were uh, Uh, we were prepared to handle what we are seeing today the number of cases that we are seeing today the number of uh, critical calls for oxygen that we are seeing today across the country uh, we should we can say with confidence that we could more or less see this a year ago and that is probably one of the greatest strengths that we had this kind of uh, proactiveness that we had in preparing for what was going to come so a year ago we what we did is we 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 formed what is called a rapid response team at the state level which is which was supposed to respond to any uh, urgent or un, unexpected situation uh, that would come in the future not just in a reactive manner but in a very proactive manner to to prepare to project what was going to come and then make preparedness so that was the whole approach that the government had the health department had as far as this pandemic is concerned so i was heading one of the verticals uh, which uh, i am still heading one of the verticals that is taking care of the infrastructure which is obviously one of the uh, important aspects of handling the pandemic especially from the health side so what the government did was we were very quick to realize that our hospitals alone wouldn't be able to handle what was going to come so we we decided to establish what are now very popularly called cflcs and cslcs now i think it has become more or less a household uh, uh, 
uh, word or uh, household uh, usage, but we decided to establish what are called frontline centers that were outside hospitals, and they would cater to patients who were, uh, you know, mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic, or patients who did not require a full-blown hospital setup to take care of them. but again required some kind of a supervision and care so that was one of the first steps that we took that was uh, that went a huge a long way in helping us uh, in this time of crisis one and a half years later so we were we managed to set up more than a lakh beds outside of the hospital scenario outside of the hospital we have more than a lakh beds in kerala where we can accommodate how many ever patients or how much ever this surge goes up the second important aspect i i would say was Uh, so i'm i'm first focusing on the health aspects of uh, handling the pandemic the second important aspect of course was testing and uh, that is again you all know how we have been very proactive in conducting tests we uh, the early phase involved a lot of contact tracing and preparing route maps and uh, ensuring that all the contacts were quarantining and they were getting tested and we were doing a lot amazing job our doctors were doing an amazing job job with syndromic surveillance in the field so even even today any person who has uh, any kind of symptom that may be indicative of covid-19 is immediately tested and if found positive immediately isolated and the person is uh, quarantined immediately so initially we started uh, quarantining everybody in the institutions but then we later realized that it it may not really be required so then the the philosophy started changed towards quarantining people at their own homes provided they were not symptomatic provided they were healthy they did not have comorbidities provided they were not elderly you know 60 plus or 70 plus uh, that would their by virtue of their age they would become uh, a high risk category provided they were not in any of these high risk categories we started quarantining them at home which was again a game changer for us because then we could focus on the patients on the people that actually required uh, uh, you know moderate to intense uh, uh, care at the, in a hospital setting so that, that again was a game changer and uh, so it it is a string of such uh, you know proactive steps that the government took proactive decisions that the government took along along with the pandemic as it progressed realizing what was happening understanding from our uh, past understanding the situation that was that we were going going through and understanding how this would pan out in the future so it is a kind of comprehensive vision that we, i think we managed to pull off uh, this kind of a, i mean i'm i'm sure that uh, at least comparatively kerala is quite well appreciated for the way we've handled the, the whole pandemic so that is as far as the health side is concerned of course along with this it goes without saying the 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 front the front line is what matters the most how much ever we sit here and and say that uh, policy is what matters or a proactive decision making is what matters it is the front line that has been fighting tirelessly day and night uh, through these uh, almost one and a half years the doctors the nurses the the uh, asha workers the anganwadi workers the cleaning staff you know the nursing attendants and what not i mean i cannot tell you an exhaustive list because it it just goes on and on the thousands and thousands of people who have extended their selfless service for the last one and a half years to combat this pandemic that is actually kerala's biggest strength our human resource is actually our biggest strength and not that not just limiting to the health sector we have the police we have all of the other frontline workers we have the the uh, the karma senas of the lsdds uh, we have uh, the the elected and official people working in the local self governments in the panchayats and and what not all, people from all walks of life as far as government as far as volunteers ngos are concerned we all came together with whatever little or uh, whatever expertise that we had and ensured that this this is actually being carried on in a in a manageable uh, way and uh, at at no point has it ever gone beyond our control is something that we should all be proud of even though the numbers are staggering even though it is something that we have never seen before even though it is put our system the government or the entire society into a situation that we have never seen before even though all of that is true we can still say with confidence that it is still within grasp and it is still we're managing it quite well the one of the reasons for this is the kind of proactive approach that everyone across in society had uh, as far as the pandemic is concerned and that is uh, in general what uh, i the way i see how this has panned out so if Uh, i have more time and if if there is anything specific that i can talk about dr rajan i'll be more than happy to do that thank you thank you thank you sri ram i think uh, you have given us like uh, reni was talking about decent health governance i think you are talking about the preparation what the government has done even for the receiving the second wave and also i remember correctly because when i was part of the covid management committee of the first wave with the government of kerala one of the thing kerala told to the uh, government also as well the supreme court was that 
we are ready to welcome three lakh returned migrants because we are already ready for them the beds. I think the preparation. I think preparation was something with other. You know, everybody was prepared. Not just health worker. You know, free ration board. You know, the you know common kitchen. You know, I think everybody was prepared. I think government is you know taking taking a lead in doing that. Thank you, Sri Ram. We will come back if you have any question clarification. We will move to the next slide. No, sir, yes. I think Sri Ram sir will uh, leave us because he is in the war room. Yeah. Uh, would you or uh, Dr. Haram, would you like to have something to Sri Ram sir right now? Uh, I have nothing because I think I have heard everything and I think we can pick it up later. But uh, if, uh, if yeah, Madam wanted to have something, Madam, you want to ask any question to him uh, straight away? Anything, uh, Dr. Nebrida? No? No, I have no questions, but I want to appreciate the work that is done. But just one point, uh, uh, Sri Ram, uh, you know, with the good governance and the good administration in Kerala, this infection number has been going up and that is causing concern and the mortality numbers. It should not happen. And this is the time for uh, the governance and the administration in Kerala to come up with some good innovative ideas that can arrest that. I think that is what is needed. And now that a brand new, um, you know, a new government is taking over, a new set of ministers and so on, I think this is a time when you youngsters, and uh, frankly, you are the people who have uh, led the first wave uh, into success. And now the second wave is, is crying for some kind of an innovation, some kind of an intervention that, in, that can make a difference. That's all I wanted to say to Sri Ram. But thank you for joining. Yes, thank you, uh, thank, thank you. Uh, sir, uh, sir, let me uh, and uh, I'm, I mean, I assure you that that is exactly what we are all working on constantly, day in and out. That we want to improve what we're doing, and we at no point have we rested thinking that we have done enough. So, obviously, your point is uh, well taken, and that is exactly what we are striving for every day. And I assure you that uh, going forward, things will uh, definitely be better than what it is, and we are constantly trying to improve now. Thank you very much for those words. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Sir, I, I wanted to just have one small thing from Sri Ram. Sir, uh, you have experienced the first wave, second wave, and Kerala has also uh, seen the brunt. And uh, looking forward uh, to combating the situation in the third wave, what would be your message to uh, uh, functionaries of other states and local administration to tackle this, if you have any two, three points to, to the other parts of the country? Uh, I don't think, uh, uh, you know, we will have any words of advice or anything to other states. But one thing that I want to say is uh, uh, we have put in certain structures uh, and like, for instance, the oxygen war room that I'm sitting in right now is one of those examples that is doing exemplary work. And we have around 20 IS officers sitting here. Uh, as, as we speak, I have four of them sitting right in four me. seven of them sitting right in front of me. Uh, listening to this and at the same time handling the whole oxygen logistics uh, of the whole state. So we have put in certain structures that we've been able to successfully use to combat, uh, to do what, what we've done as far as the pandemic is concerned. What I want to say at this moment is we will be the happiest people to share what we've done with anybody that is interested to see what is happening in Kerala, to anyone who's interested to, you know, kind of get inspired from it or maybe comment on it or help us improve either way it can be two way communication if anybody is ever interested in telling us something or gaining something from us we'll be the we'll be the happiest people we'll be very open to sharing whatever we've done we'll be also be open to criticism and comments so that is one thing that i want to say and that we should this is a time that uh, so because this is something that we none of us has seen before this is something entirely new to all of us maybe we've read in some textbooks or something but that's it our experience with handling something of this sort is it is unprecedented we don't have any experience so what we can, the only thing we can do is learn from each other. There is something great that Delhi has done or some other state has done. We can learn from that. There is something good that Kerala has done. The other states can learn from that. So we are, we are constantly trying to see, look at other models across the country, across the world to see what works for us. If anybody is interested in that kind of a support or a cooperation that they want, Kerala will be more than happy to join them. So that's what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, one, Mr. Arun, Mr. Mr. Arun, want to ask some question? Arun, speak yeah. yeah. from the Economic Times. Yeah, I just want to make a suggestion Yeah, that if the, those who in Kerala who are doing a fantastic job could kindly document what they are doing as it goes on and make this available for people on a real-time basis, other states would be able to learn. Yeah, uh, so, yeah I uh, point uh, understood, uh, Mr. Arun. So 
what uh, maybe this is uh, not something that we publicize too much but what i want to say is each and every uh, document that we prepare each and every guideline each and every protocol each and every uh, uh, thing that we come up with and is documented is put up immediately on the website of the director of health services it, everything is available right from the first day the first case was detected each and every piece of paper is available on the website of the directorate of health services government of kerala including all the treatment protocols including all the management criteria including the uh, the criteria that we uh, the, the sops that we put in into the war room everything is available on the dhs website so uh, apart from that if anybody gets in touch with us we'll be more than happy to share anything right dilip sir have yes. something but nivata yes. was saying something yes yeah, dilip there will be the last one because we have to go to the next one dilip you were the last question yeah dilip please uh, yeah yes uh, sir uh, Uh, with related to the vaccine, so uh, what is the target actually the government of Kerala has set in terms of because many of the state, many of the countries have shown vaccine can be one of the can play a very crucial role in terms of containing the number of cases as well as the death. So, but there is a vaccine shortage and Kerala has, has already been actually given a tender for uh, one crore actually vaccine. So, what is the target you have set and if if we if Kerala could be able to achieve certain level and what is the level that will be an actually an ideal point where the cases and other things can be controlled i uh, see i agree with the first part of what you said that vaccine is definitely going to be it has already been a game changer even when we look at the actual cases that are happening uh, we can see that people who have been vaccinated with both doses have very mild forms of the infection even though people who are vaccinated are getting infected uh, the severity of the illness is coming down drastically the number of deaths is lower so the de vaccine definitely has an impact it has an effect to a role to play in in the future in curbing this uh, uh, this pandemic and what you said is again right that the government has already placed orders directly with uh, some of the vendors in addition to what the government of india is supplying us for all the priority groups but when you ask me what is your target our target ideally would be to vaccinate everyone like like every state and like every country in the world would want to vaccinate their entire population and as far as uh, if if you mean a very technical question of what percentage is uh, yeah, would be enough to achieve herd immunity that is a very tricky question because right now i wouldn't have enough data to tell you what percentage is the minimum that we want to achieve uh, to reach herd immunity status the the idea of herd immunity uh, with respect to the sars cov2 virus is itself uh, under debate right now which is being discussed with all the academic circles i'm not the best person to comment on that and as and when we get a clear idea of how what is that minimum percentage what is the magic number that would become our target but our, our ideal target would, would be to cover everyone every eligible person with a vaccine thank you thank you thank, thank you sriram you. for taking uh, taking some time out of your busy schedule be part with us and i think that when the time comes probably when you are little free we i think we should document the experiences of kerala because i think we have some documents already people are publishing on how kerala managed covid 19 but it should be documented so that like people can use it at a later time thank you sriram we will move to the next speaker Uh, next speaker is uh, uh, Mr. T M Satyan, coordinator of the Action Aid Association. It is your time, sir, for ten to ten minutes. Ah, namaskaram. Malayalathil aana jan samsaari kinnu. Ah, Renindu parinu rala transfer team na ana parani di kinnu. I COVID ande berina thine Mumbai, Kerala thile okim. Adhin sheesham orlam ha pralayum orare sangiramai nilkanda samayta ana. ഒന്നാം ഘട്ടം ഈ കോവിഡ് വരുന്നത് കേരളത്തിന്റെ ഒരു സാമ്പത്തിക സാമൂഹ്യ മേഖലകളിൽ ഏറ്റവും ചലനമുണ്ടാക്കിയ ഒന്നായിരുന്നു ഈ രണ്ട് ദുരന്തങ്ങൾ ആ ദുരന്തത്തിന്റെ ഇടയിലാണ് കേരളത്തിന്റെ പുനർനിർമ്മാണ പദ്ധതിയുമായി ബന്ധപ്പെട്ട് പ്രവർത്തനവുമായി പുനർനിർമ്മാണ പ്രവർത്തനത്തിന്റെ ഭാഗമായാണ് നാഷണൽ എയ്ഡ് അസോസിയേഷൻ കേരളത്തിൽ ഞാൻ അതിന്റെ ഭാഗമായി നിന്ന് പ്രവർത്തിക്കുന്ന ആളാണ് കേരളത്തിൽ വരുന്നത് അപ്പൊ കേരളത്തിന്റെ പ്രത്യേകിച്ച് പത്തനംതിട്ട ഇടുക്കി പാലക്കാട് വയനാട് പത്തനംതിട്ട ഈ അഞ്ച് ജില്ലകളിലായിരുന്നു നാഷണൽ എയ്ഡ് അസോസിയേഷൻ ഇത്തരം മേഖലയിൽ നിന്നുകൊണ്ട് പ്രവർത്തിച്ച് കേരളത്തിന്റെ പുനർനിർമ്മാണ പ്രവർത്തനത്തിന്റെ ഭാഗമായാണ് ഈ പ്രവർത്തനങ്ങളൊക്കെ ചെയ്തത് പ്രധാനമായിട്ടും ദളിത് കോളനികളെ കേന്ദ്രീകരിച്ചുകൊണ്ട് ആ ദളിത് കോളനികളെ കേന്ദ്രീകരിച്ചുകൊണ്ടുള്ള പ്രവർത്തനമായിരുന്നു അതിൽ പ്രധാനപ്പെട്ട ഒന്നാണ് അംഗൻവാടികൾ ആ അംഗൻവാടികൾ എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് ചോർന്നൊലിക്കുന്ന വാടക കെട്ടിടത്തിലും ഒപ്പം തന്നെ പ്രളയത്തിൽ തകർന്നു പോയ ഒരു സ്ഥിതിവിശേഷം ഉണ്ടായിരുന്നു അവിടെ അതിന്റെ പുനർനിർമ്മാണവും ഒപ്പം തന്നെ പുതിയ കെട്ടിടങ്ങൾ നിർമ്മിക്കുന്നതുമായി ബന്ധപ്പെട്ട് വളരെ ഗൗരവരമായി ഇടപെടുന്നുണ്ട് അതിന്റെ ഒരു പ
സാധാരണ ജനങ്ങൾ ആദിവാസി ദളിതർ ഉൾപ്പെടെയുള്ള സാധാരണക്കാർ പഠിക്കുന്ന ഒരിടമായിരുന്നു ഈ അംഗൻവാടി എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് അപ്പൊ അതിന്റെ ഒരു മെച്ചമായ രീതിയിലുള്ള അതിനെ നിലനിർത്തുക എന്ന് പറയുന്ന ഒരു പ്രവർത്തനത്തിൽ ആഷ്നയുടെ വളരെ സജീവമായി ഗവൺമെന്റിനോടൊപ്പം നിന്ന് കേരളത്തിന്റെ പുനർനിർമ്മാണ പദ്ധതിയുടെ ഭാഗമായി നിന്നുകൊണ്ടാണ് പ്രവർത്തിച്ചത് ആ സമയത്ത് നമ്മൾ ആയിരക്കണക്കിന് ഫാമിലികൾക്ക് ഭക്ഷണ കിറ്റുകൾ വിതരണം ചെയ്യുന്നു അപ്പം ആ സമയത്താണ് രണ്ടായിരത്തി ഇരുപതിലെ കോവിഡ് മഹാമാരി വരുന്നത് അഷ്ണയുടെ പ്രവർത്തനം ആ സമയത്ത് ഇവിടെ നിലനിൽക്കുന്നുണ്ട് തന്നെ കോവിഡ് മഹാമാരിയുമായി ബന്ധപ്പെട്ടും ഏറ്റവും കൂടുതൽ ഇത് ബാധിച്ച ജനവിഭാഗം എന്ന നിലയിൽ വെള്ളപ്പൊക്കം പോലെ തന്നെ ബാധിച്ചത് ഇവിടുത്തെ സാധാരണക്കാരെയായിരുന്നു പ്രത്യേകിച്ച് ദളിത് ആദിവാസി മേഖലയിൽപ്പെട്ടവരായിരുന്നു അതുകൊണ്ട് തന്നെ അവരുടെ ഈ സർക്കാർ മേഖലയിൽ നിന്നുള്ള ഭക്ഷ്യ കിറ്റുകളും ഒക്കെ വളരെ കൃത്യമായി എത്തുന്നുണ്ടെങ്കിൽ പോലും പലപ്പോഴും അത് വലിയ ഫാമിലിക്ക് അത് തികയാതെ വരുന്ന ഒരു സാഹചര്യം ഉണ്ടായിരുന്നു മാസത്തിൽ ഒരിക്കൽ കിട്ടുന്നതുകൊണ്ട് തന്നെ അതുകൊണ്ട് തൊഴിൽ മേഖലകൾ നഷ്ടപ്പെട്ടത് കൊണ്ട് തന്നെ തൊഴിലെടുക്കാൻ പോകാത്ത സാഹചര്യം നിലനിൽക്കുന്നത് കൊണ്ട് തന്നെ അതിനെ ബ്രേക്ക് ചെയ്യാൻ വേണ്ടി അവരുടെ സാമ്പത്തിക ഭദ്രത ഇല്ലായെന്നത് കൊണ്ട് തന്നെ അവരുടെ ഭക്ഷണ കാര്യങ്ങളെ ഗൗരവരമായി എടുത്തുകൊണ്ട് തന്നെ ആഷ്നൈഡ് അസോസിയേഷൻ കോവിഡ് കാലത്ത് ഈ ഭക്ഷണ സാധനങ്ങൾ അവർക്ക് എത്തിച്ചു കൊടുക്കാനുള്ള നടപടിക്രമങ്ങൾ സ്വീകരിക്കുകയും അങ്ങനെ പിന്നെ പത്തനംതിട്ട ജില്ലയിലെ ഇരവരൂർ ഗ്രാമപഞ്ചായത്തിലും പത്തനംതിട്ട ജില്ലയിലെ തന്നെ പന്തളം മുനിസിപ്പാലിറ്റിയിലും ഇത്തരം പ്രവർത്തനങ്ങൾ നമ്മൾ ചെയ്തു എന്നുള്ളതാണ് അതിൻ്റെ ഒരു പ്രധാനപ്പെട്ട ഒരു സംഭവം നമ്മൾ ഗവൺമെന്റിനോടൊപ്പം നിന്ന് ഇത്തരം കാര്യങ്ങളിൽ ഇടപെടുകയും പ്രവർത്തിക്കുകയും ചെയ്യുമ്പോൾ ഇവിടെ മുമ്പ് എനിക്ക് മുമ്പ് സംസാരിച്ചവർ പറഞ്ഞതുപോലെ തന്നെ ഗവൺമെന്റിന്റെ ഒരു കാഴ്ചയുണ്ട് പ്രത്യേകിച്ച് അംഗൻവാടി പിന്നെ ആശാവർക്കർ കുടുംബശ്രീ യൂണിറ്റുകളെയുമായി ബന്ധപ്പെടുത്തിക്കൊണ്ട് താഴെത്തട്ടിൽ ഗ്രാസ് റൂട്ട് ലെവലിൽ പിന്നെ ഇതിനെ എങ്ങനെയാണ് മറികടക്കാൻ കഴിയുന്നത് കോവിഡിനെ എങ്ങനെയാണ് മറികടക്കാൻ കഴിയുന്നത് പറയുന്ന വളരെ ഗൗരവരമായ ഒരു 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 കണ്ട ഒരു ഒരു ഇടപെടലുകൾ ഗവൺമെന്റ് നടക്കുന്നുണ്ട് ഒരു പക്ഷേ അതാണ് ഈ പിന്നെ ഗ്രാമങ്ങളെ പ്രത്യേകിച്ച് ഗ്രാമപ്രദേശത്തെ ജനങ്ങളെ അധികം അഫക്റ്റ് ചെയ്യാതെ തന്നെ നില ബാധിക്കാതെ തന്നെ പിടിച്ചു നിർത്തുന്ന ഒരു പ്രധാന ഘടകം ഈ ഇവരുടെ ഒരു പഞ്ചായത്ത് മെമ്പർ ഉൾപ്പെടെയുള്ള ആൾക്കാർ ഈ മേഖലകളിലൊക്കെ നമ്മളും ഇടപെടുന്നുണ്ട് പ്രത്യേകിച്ച് ഈ ഈ പഞ്ചായത്തിലെ ചില പ്രദേശങ്ങളിലൊക്കെ നമ്മൾ അത്തരം കാര്യങ്ങൾ ഇടപെടുന്നുണ്ട് അപ്പൊ ഇത്തരം ഒരു യൂണിറ്റ് സാമൂഹിക സംസ്കാരി ആൾക്കാരെ കൊണ്ട് ചേർന്നുകൊണ്ട് ഒരു പ്രദേശത്തെ നിരീക്ഷിക്കുകയും ആ പ്രദേശത്ത് ഒരു രോഗലക്ഷണം ഉണ്ടെങ്കിൽ പെട്ടെന്ന് തന്നെ അതിനെ ക്വാറന്റൈൻ ചെയ്യാനും ചികിത്സ ലഭിക്കത്തക്ക രീതിയിലുള്ള അത് സ്പ്രെഡ് ആകാതിരിക്കാനുള്ള നടപടികൾ സ്വീകരിക്കുന്നു എന്നുള്ള ഒരു പ്രവർത്തനമാണ് ഇതിന്റെ താഴെത്തട്ടിൽ വളരെ ഗൗരവരമായിട്ട് നടക്കുന്നത് അതുകൊണ്ടാണ് ഇത് വളരെ പെട്ടെന്ന് സ്പ്രെഡ് ചെയ്യാതെ പോകുന്നതെന്നുള്ളതാണ് ഏറ്റവും പ്രധാനപ്പെട്ട ഒരു കാര്യം അതുകൊണ്ട് ഗ്രാമതലങ്ങളിൽ ഇത് വളരെ സൂക്ഷ്മമായ രീതിയിൽ ഇതിനെ പരിശോധിക്കുകയും മനസ്സിലാക്കുകയും വളരെ ഗൗരവത്തോടു കൂടി ഇതിനെ കാണുകയും ആ ആശാവർക്കർ ഉൾപ്പെടെയുള്ള ഒരു ടീമിനെ വാർഡ് മെമ്പർ ആശാവർക്കർ ഉൾപ്പെടെ ഒരു ടീമിനെ മുൻനിർത്തിക്കൊണ്ട് ഇതിന്റെ സ്പ്ലഡ് നിയന്ത്രിക്കാൻ കഴിയുന്നു എന്നുള്ളതാണ് ഏറ്റവും പ്രധാനപ്പെട്ടത് ഇവിടെ ആക്ഷനേഡ് അസോസിയേഷൻ പോലുള്ള പിന്നെ സന്നദ്ധ സംഘടന എൻ ജി ഒ അതിനകത്ത് വളരെ ഗൗരവമായി ചെയ്യുന്ന ഒരു പ്രവർത്തനം ഞാൻ മുമ്പ് പറഞ്ഞതുപോലെ അവരുടെ ആവശ്യമായ പ്രത്യേകിച്ച് ജീവനോപാധികളുമായി ബന്ധപ്പെട്ടുള്ള പ്രവർത്തനങ്ങളിൽ എങ്ങനെയാണ് ഇടപെടേണ്ടത് എങ്ങനെയാണ് അവരുടെ മുൻകൂട്ട് നയിക്കുള്ള അവരുടെ ജീവിതക്രമങ്ങളെ ക്രമപ്പെടുത്തേണ്ടത് എന്നൊക്കെ പറയുന്ന കൂട്ടങ്ങളെ സംബന്ധിച്ചുള്ള ക്ലാസ്സുകൾ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ അത്തരം വർത്തമാനങ്ങൾ അവരുമായിട്ട് നടത്തുന്നുണ്ടോ എന്നുള്ളതാണ് ആ രീതിയിലുള്ള ബന്ധം ഈ മേഖലയിലെ ഗ്രാമപ്രദേശങ്ങളിൽ ജനങ്ങളുമായി നമ്മൾ പോകും പ്രത്യേകിച്ച് ഇപ്പോഴും ഈ മാസവും ഗവൺമെന്റ് ഇത്തരം മേഖലകളിലുള്ള ജനങ്ങൾക്ക് ഭക്ഷ ഭക്ഷണ സാധനങ്ങൾ എത്തിച്ചു കൊടുക്കുന്നുണ്ട് അത് പക്ഷേ അപര്യാപ്തതയാണ് കാരണം സാധാരണ ജനങ്ങൾ എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് അന്നന്ന് ജോലി ചെയ്ത് ജീവിക്കുന്ന പ്രത്യേകിച്ച് ദൽ കമ്മ്യൂണിറ്റിയിൽപ്പെട്ട ആൾക്കാർ ഈ പ്രദേശത്തൊക്കെയുള്ള ജനങ്ങൾ അങ്ങനെയുള്ളവരാണ് സർക്കാരിൻ്റെ സാധനം അവർ സർക്കാർ കൊടുക്കുന്ന ഏറ്റവും വലിയ നല്ല കാര്യമാണ് അപ്പൊ തന്നെ അത് അതിന്റെ ഒരു പോരായ്മയുണ്ട്
ഒക്കെ ചെയ്യുന്ന ഒരു നടപടിക്രമങ്ങളുണ്ട് പി ടി ടി ഒക്കെ ഇട്ടൊക്കെ ഇട്ടുകൊണ്ട് ഇടപെടാൻ കഴിയുന്ന ഒരു സാധ്യതയുണ്ട് അവിടെ എങ്ങനെയാണ് ഒരു സംഘടന ഒരു ജനകീയ സംഘടന അല്ലെങ്കിൽ ജിയെ പോലുള്ള ഒരു സംഘടനകൾ ഇടപെടേണ്ടത് അതിന് തക്കതായിട്ടുള്ള ഒരു ടീം വളരെ ഗൗരവരമായി കൂടെ വർക്ക് ചെയ്യണം ഇതാണ് ഒരു പക്ഷേ ഉണ്ടാകേണ്ടത് ആ രീതിയിലാണ് കേരളത്തിന്റെ ഈ രണ്ടാം ഘട്ടത്തെ പോലും പിടിച്ചു നിർത്താൻ കഴിയുന്ന ഒരു തരത്തിൽ ഒരു സാമൂഹിക ആരോഗ്യ സംവിധാനം കേരളത്തിൽ ഉള്ളത് കൊണ്ട് തന്നെ വളരെ ഗൗരവരമായി ഇതിനെ കേരളത്തിൽ പിടിച്ചു കെട്ടാൻ കഴിയുന്നുണ്ട് ആ അർത്ഥത്തിലാണ് ഇത്തരം കാര്യങ്ങളുമായി മുമ്പോട്ട് പോകുന്നത് ഒപ്പം തന്നെ ഈ ആക്ഷനൈഡ് അസോസിയേഷൻ ഇത്തരം മേഖലയിൽ വളരെ ഗൗരവരമായി പ്രത്യേകിച്ച് ആൾക്കാരുടെ ദൈനംദിന ജീവിതങ്ങളിലെ അവരുടെ ഭക്ഷണം ഉൾപ്പെടെയുള്ള കാര്യങ്ങളിൽ ഇടപെടുന്നു എന്നുള്ളതിൽ ഏറ്റവും അഭിമാനമുണ്ട് താങ്ക് യു Uh, thank you satyan uh, arjun is anybody translating his thing or uh... yes, sir reni reni is translating uh, i will i will get it done sir i i will do that okay okay reni sir uh, sir if you want to do it now please do it yes reni sir yes uh, yeah. satyan satyan is Let's quickly do that yeah yes sir satyan is representing the actionaid association and he is based in uh, iravi perur Uh, in patanathatta district his actual place is odara and uh, the action aid initiative has started its work during the uh, the flood of 2018 they have started with uh, some anganwadi reconstruction but when it comes to the covid uh, uh, 19 the first wave they have uh, worked very focusedly at iravibeeru panchayat and uh, pandallam municipality they focus more on the dalit communities and uh, they have sub, uh, supplemented uh, the dalit communities with uh, uh, free food and uh, what he has specifically focused the, the panchayat level convergence that is happening with the uh, volunteers uh, asha workers and uh, the youth in the community uh, there is something called the ward level task force ward level task force uh, is is something which is a special initiative in kerala and uh, uh, the action aid association has worked closely with them and uh, this has brought good result when it comes to the the support to the covid positive families and covid affected uh, families and when it comes to the first line treatment and uh, hospital taking them to hospital with the ambulance and other other things then uh, we also uh, focused on the the political parties having their youth wings Uh, coming up with as youth volunteers uh, irrespective of the party lines they help people uh, with their uh, youth uh, volunteer uh, teams uh, they will wear uh, pp kits and uh, they will provide whatever support is uh, necessary uh, this is the way action aid association is working and he is thanking each and every one of you for this opportunity thank you very much thank you thank you reni like other speak, thank you reni like other speakers i think satyan also mentioned about this what is called the decentralized governance but he talked about uh, asa worker at the very local level how they were able to manage with the youth support and other thing so we will uh, uh, go to the next speaker mr john samuel a former international director action aid association your time sir john yeah thank so thank you very much uh you know i i would say that i am the director of a uh, founder of bodhigra in kerala and also the director of president of institute of sustainable development and governance i used to be in the international director of actually around 10 years ago okay so, uh, because so i just wanted to clarify so i just wanted to tell at the outset you know i tend to agree with many of those points but i would like to give a bit, bit of a different perspective with a detached perspective first i would say that you know as somebody who lived most of the time in uh, you know development sector and public policy and governance outside kerala for you know almost 30 years and now inside kerala i could see a dichotomy when a malayali speaks inside kerala there is an exceptionalism and a self congratulatory note saying that we are better and uh, uh, this i'm sure uh, madam Nivedi, Nivedi da, he hadn't would understand because she was in Kerala and now she is outside. Now, uh, you know, it is a dichotomy. Let us uh, look at the facts and figures. 
if you look at the covid situation i was here from march uh, early march onwards the first phase we did very well by 100% lockout actually uh, on on actually a very very much a panic response you know even in kerala you talk about all the governance all the roads were closed with the rubble you know i mean road blocks and there were lots of unscientific things were happening and the police were taken care of the covid uh, so there was a fear psychosis concept and along with that you know the kerala numbers were less because you know very strict control and the response to the society was not so good i remember a family came from italy they were totally stigmatized and you should know this let us uh, you know the first phase many people were so scared to come from gulf and other places there was lots of stigmatization all over the social media and the so called civil society and environment is and that the kind of explicit abuse was showered on this this family who just happened to come and at the first thing you know and by mistake they were haunted let's not uh, you know mistake what was happened in the first phase then the police took over and then we were in a self congratulatory public relations exercise uh you know kerala is the model of the world right and i was actively involved in the public discourse at that time and i said things will go out of hand in may and it did go out of hand by july right so the kind of you really look at even the first wave itself after the initial four months we uh, we lost control it. you know in the first three months we could not even malayali could not come to kerala and there were lots of protests on all those uh, you know check posts and then you have come uh, you have you know we call it the first thing was we had taken an extreme step by june july we let it go and you just look at from july onwards the extent of the uh, you know the spread increased tremendously and at one point in time we are talking about kerala model kerala had the second la- largest you know uh, incidence of uh, covid positive cases just next to uh, maharashtra and uh, if you look at the trp it was one of the highest so let us have a perspective on this right the perspective is we were trying to do in the first phase very well second phase we got out of control but the social protection initiative the government was very active but let us not forget from december from panchayat election onwards for three months the political leaders of all party including the party which which i am associated with has completely you know left everything political leaders none of them used mask almost all of them were sick for three months we have taken the people for granted public policy for granted none of the government spoke and that is why the second wave we lost control totally and it was soon after the election and this is not one one political party every single political party they draw shows you know a big meetings and many people didn't use mask and i noticed this everywhere and now you come into the second wave we started acting when you hit the whole thing i mean when we cross 25000 incidents a day even now as i speak now the mortality rate is, you know you cross 100 and here also there is a bit of under reporting so let us take a perspective on this okay this is we have to take uh, saying that kerala is not very rosy picture of model development anymore kerala model was discussed till june 2020 in 2021 june kerala is no longer a model let us accept the fact kerala is as perplexed as any other states are now let us talk the positive things 
what is the difference between kerala and many other states in kerala there is a sense there is a government that is it. governance and government is around and this was done through very strategic communication on a very ongoing thing i lost many members of my own family to covid right yesterday i lost somebody day before i lost somebody and what the hell we are talking about we are taking care you know the point about it is people are dying in my village people who are saying that you know rainy that it is not happening in my village today two people died and you are saying that there is no death and at the same time don't forget that every day i give 100 packet of food today also personally deliver with the volunteers you know with the number of volunteers to people who are suffering from covid so i am actively involved even in the first wave i was involved in supporting 3000 family you know uh, you know with the food kit etc so the problem about it is what are the positive things three positive things kerala has the highest per capita bed in the hospitals in my village itself i have calculated there are 150 beds in my panchayat patrandita and this is not only the government but also the private sector and this is very important to understand in kerala there are two positive things one is we have a public health care system right up to the village phc so i went and took my vaccination without spending any money you know and that is the governance advantage when there i had to only wait 15 minutes i got the what you call vaccination and okay, came you know it's just 1 kilometer from my home and that is where the grassroots reach out of the public care uh, healthcare system cumulatively built over a period of time is the biggest strength of kerala you know second we also have a very good local government system and this is very very much true in the first part when people were really uh, starving the community kitchens did make a big difference that is the second uh, you know point the third point is kerala has one of the best private health care system don't forget that so whether you know if, if you look at my district Ah, Patrathir district. There are two medical colleges, right? One in Kone and in Tiruvall. The tertiary care hospital system five, including Parimala. So the point about it is that uh, private healthcare also played a very very important role in uh, COVID uh, response and management. And I wanted that to be said. The third part of it is it's a very important thing. Is Kerala has a very active civil society. And by civil society, it's only not the conventional NGOs. You have to understand. Kerala political parties are very active. You know, political parties, whether the ruling uh, political party, CPM, uh, and the DYF, or the Congress, even, uh, you know, BJP to some extent, uh, very much faith groups, church groups, and others, residents association, what am I know, all of them join hands to provide support. And this is something which is which is a very very different. Even in the number of deaths, you know, day for yesterday, a friend of mine died who is just 53 years old. There was nobody to support, but you know, the volunteers, local volunteers, Congress volunteers, and other party volunteers who, who, who helped to bury the body in the church. This is something which is Kerala is uh, very unique, and uh, this was. This is very different from others. There is a collective sense of responsibility and social capital and social solidarity in Kerala. And this is because of three reasons. One is the density of population is very high. Number two is now people are dying. You also know that you may also die. Right? So there is a sense of empathy which is happening. And empathy is a very, very important uh, sense which is happening. The third, Kerala has an associational revolution. Kerala is the one with the maximum number of civil society associations. You know, not many people know. 
in almost every village we have a, 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 a you know library a, a club or this or that some sort of association ymc some sort of residents association so these associational forms provide a sense of uh, solidarity last but the not not the least last point yeah. John, I, i'm summing up yeah. nobody has talked about the economic consequences of this you know 12 lakhs people iradhi and chutra according to this thing have come back from the gulf and kerala has a huge number of vulnerable population vulnerable middle class you know kerala has very rich people around 10 that they are less than 10 percentage large number of people are what you call vulnerable middle class they earn around 30 to 40000 rupees a month you know and live what you call a decent life they may have and covid just you know destroy their life destroy their livelihood and we have to see this that is why the kit from the government look in with an exaggerated sense of what you call bounty because what happened is there was a lots of economic insecurity social insecurity and health insecurity within the state of kerala and the difference between uh, you know delhi and kerala is here we have a sense we have a government we have a governance system we have people to support so i feel very secure in my village you know i live in a village but you know i am in touch with everybody because we know there are people you know our people and this is across caste and creed so there is a active civil society there is an active government and i would say that with all the problems you know i don't want to point fingers only on the government for the spread of uh, this thing it is the problem of the government as well as the people we take it for granted for 3 months from december to april and that is why it has gone out of hand at the moment thank you very much thank you thank you john thank you john we'll come back later i think you have been pointed that collective failure and collective success but one of the point i want to mention to you is that last february probably 2020 by end of uh, march when the lockdown was announced in the country before that kerala was number 1 maharashtra was number 2 with a three point difference so kerala was number 1 in the first wave for few days then maharashtra took over of course then i don't think we are you know like so i think kerala was number 1 so now of course kerala is number 2 it can reach even number 1 right now we don't know because i think collective failure and collective success we should celebrate it uh, thank you mr john and now we will move to uh, professor vinod jabravam uh, of center for development studies to give an overview on uh, his experience hello uh, am i audible yes 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 vinod yeah okay thank you thank you professor irde rajan thank you dr vinod nivedita thank you dr arjun for uh, inviting me to share my thoughts uh, i am more of a an amateur practitioner than a real life practitioner in the field actually so my observations are, are uh, more of a macro kind rather than uh, the ground uh, reality that i will just throw light on two aspects uh, with regard to covid uh, first as well as the second more important the second now the first aspect is regarding the health aspect of it and second is about the livelihood issues relating to now as uh, with regarding to the health care facilities how uh, the entire uh, health care facilities have developed and how it has helped covid that has already been told so i don't think i should be able to i should uh, describe much on this but i i want to uh, kind of highlight one or two aspects which uh, 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 on the background of which we should see the covid case of kerala now what is the background now if you look at kerala kerala was one of the states that ideally there should have been much much more number of cases much much more number of deaths and much much more number of covid related uh, problems actually now why i am saying this thing is as uh, one of the speakers uh, had already mentioned urbanization right kerala you know, though the 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 they talk is called as a, a rural reality there is actually very less little of a rural reality in kerala actually. i mean kerala is more of an urban society even in the rural areas we can say that it is a continuum of the urban or the urban is a continuum of the rural so it's a kind of a mix both rural and the urban are somewhat very mixed 
and if you had uh, looked at the today's uh, hindu newspaper there was this uh, uh, comparison of various indicators of uh, rural and urban across different states uh, with regard to covid care aspect. and you can see if you look at the kerala specifically you can see that the uh, in terms of differences between rural and urban there is hardly any difference in kerala but other other states of course they do, they do show now if this is in case of death this is in case of also treatment this is in case of people who have having covid this is also in case of people who have been treated and who have survived covid so the, the so the rural urban difference that we are talking about in kerala that's not much thank you now why i am trying to highlight this thing is that uh, as professor radin would completely agree aged population so the most vulnerable aged population in kerala we kerala has the highest share of aged population and therefore we should have experienced the largest number of covid cases as well as covid deaths also we should have because that aged people are the ones who are most vulnerable to death right but as you would see if you, if you compare with the national level kerala has got one of the lowest death rates in india right now okay rural or urban okay and the number of cases that we have we should have experienced much more of covid number of if we are number 1 or number 2 but we should have been much much higher because the rate of urbanization is the highest in the country today 50% of the more than 50% of the population is urbanized population in K of Kerala is urbanized so it should have been much much more than that so what i am trying to say is that uh, yes we have uh, in terms of the numbers if you look at kerala is one of the highest uh, has the number of highest cases and also if you look at the number of deaths over a period of time it has touched even 100 today we were one of the speakers have just said that it has almost touched 100 but if not for the kind of system that have uh, that has already been talked about that is with regard to decentralized governance the uh, government decentralized governance then the and the healthcare that we are talking about this would have been a very very different story and what has been the structure which has already been told about now the second important aspect that is, that we need to look at over healthcare now in most other places when we are talking about healthcare in india aspect the focus is mostly with regard to the hospital sector the hospital and the health sector is what is what is being focused on but uh, notice that when we are talking about healthcare in kerala we are talking about governance rather than healthcare specifically we are talking about decentralization we are talking about local governance now that is where the beauty of decentralized governance and touches every aspect of life if we if we were talking about livelihood we would have spoken about governance if we were talking about health we would be speaking about this if we were talking about patriarchy we would be speaking about the uh, governance as it is so it touches almost every facet of life and the structure that has already been talked about by many others the structure that has been uh, developed over a period of time by various uh, governments as well as other uh, civil society organizations that came together in helping building this governance the decentralized governance structure which has got various uh various uh, parts of it it is not simply the locally elected government as such it also consists of the civil society it also consists of the community services that we are enjoying so all of this together is kind of a very very important plays very important roles in terms of the uh, kind of outcomes that we have seen in terms of the governance part, uh, governance of covid and that has certainly helped in this case. so that's uh, i mean and this has broadly been spoken already by many of the other speakers now the second aspect that i want to take your attention to probably uh, is about the livelihood aspect now again professor rajan uh, is very well aware of this thing that uh, kerala and uh, professor rajan has written much about this thing the remittances the dependence of kerala economy on remittances and we know that uh, uh, the, the one of the largest segments that are going to be our our already affected and are continuing to be affected is the international migrants who are either come back who have already either come back or who have lost their jobs and are there in the gulf sector so and uh, 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 estimate done by rajan professor rajan and others also so roughly about 30 percent 24 to 30 there are arguments about how much exactly it is but the the measure shows that roughly about 24 to 30 percent of the gdp the state domestic product consists of remittances now if that kind of a huge effect is there on the economy we can say that the uh, every 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 livelihood every livelihood source would be affected affected it is not and mind you mind you it is not only the families where migrants are there that will be affected where internal uh, international migrants are there because the 
Kerala is being con primarily a consumer society, an economy that is driven by consumption. When the remittances fall, it falls. The, it it affects the entire state. It is not just the uh, households with the migrants. Actually, it affects the entire state because all producer, uh, what we call all production sectors, are linked to the consumption activities of remit uh, relating to remittances. Actually. So that's going to be that's that is one sector that is one region that is going to have very severe effect in uh, following the second wave and the future also. Now, after COVID, the, the, the periods after COVID also is to be very, is to be seen very carefully because employment opportunities outside of Kerala, outside of India, uh, are also not so, so easy to come by. So uh, it is said that usually, usually it is said that when after a pandemic, there is after a, uh, after a kind of a large pandemic, like there are huge booms in economic sectors. There can be huge booms in that. If such booms takes place, obviously it will be good for Kerala as well as the rest of the economy. But if such if it doesn't occur, then it's going to be a very difficult thing for Kerala. That's one thing with regard to remittances and migrants. And second most important thing that Kerala used to depend upon is with regard to the tourism sector. Kerala is one of the most important revenue sources after uh, remittance comes for the government as well as for private living livelihood has been the tourism sector. And we can see that tourism is almost completely washed away, completely dead. There is nothing called tourism at all. There is nothing local, domestic, international, nothing is happening right now. And nothing can happen in the near future also. Even if whatever the Kerala is trying to, during the uh, periods between the first and the second wave, Kerala had tried to uh, kind of develop a kind of a packages where it was allowed for, they were trying to bring in some tourists at all, but that, is, that was not very successful. And the future of that does not look to be very, uh, very bright at the point, at, uh, right now. So in terms of tourism, one of the important sectors of Kerala's uh, revenue sources, that is also quite weak now. Now, other sectors like manufacturing, or uh, uh, I mean, uh, manufacturing traditionally had been a very poor sector, very weak sector in Kerala. But whatever existing in Kerala, that had also been, uh, that's a, that has also kind of weak now. Now, uh, in short, what I'll say that the sources of livelihood, though we have been able to manage pandemic very well, we are, we are managing very well compared to other states uh, or even compared to many other countries also, we have been managing pandemic quite well. But the future of Kerala, even though we are managing pandemic very well, the livelihood issues with, with regard to Kerala, that does not seem to be very bright. That seems to be quite, quite bleak, the future that is becoming. I think I'll stop here. If there are any uh, uh, questions and comments, uh, we will take it up later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vinoj. I think Vinoj has really pointed out that maybe we have succeeded in controlling COVID, but the impact on short, long term, and short term impact on livelihood is going to be a focus. We should uh, think on that. I think uh, we have completed all our panelists. I think if I am going to give maybe two to three minutes for our discussion. We have basically three discussion right now with us. I think we have four, looks like. Uh, we we'll move to Dr. Dilip uh, for uh, three minutes. You can have some intervention, Dr. Dilip. Dr. Dilip, are you there? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm very much just, there. Just three minutes. We are running out of time, yeah. Uh, sir, uh, uh... I, I may not even require the three minutes or so, sir, but just actually some cursory comments I just wanted to make. So it would be on the basis of the talk which the, already the, the people have talked upon and some comments to them as well as actually certain comments which I wanted to make. Uh, as many of the speakers have very rightly pointed out, so when we were trying to work on a paper with, when, during the, actually the first wave, uh, it, we could be able to see certain aspects, either in terms of the uh, one, in terms of the health infrastructure, the second one in terms of the, the social system in which actually the, the Kerala has. And the third one is the conversion aspect. So when it comes to the actually the social structure, so we all know actually, so Kerala is one that actually uh, brought in very uh, anti-caste and anti, uh, uh, this one, anti anti caste actually and uh, uh, anti caste actually act in a very very uh, yeah, yeah. anti caste the acts which related to in terms of protecting the rights of the Dalits and the Adivasis and this gave some strength in terms of actually when they talk about the uh, very vigilant actually the civil society the civil society should is comprises of all the people including including the Dalits and the Adivasis and 
the second thing when it comes to actually uh, the health system health system we all know kerala has a very very strong health system and uh, because of this actually vigilant actually civil society combined with the health system only the kerala state is very very resilient in terms of addressing many of the uh, catastrophe which is happening in kerala and uh, taking this into account so either in terms of the the current actually the 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 problem which which we are facing either in terms of the covid the first way we could able to they could able to address it in a very very good way good way till the june the comment which i wanted to make here is that as very clearly uh, sir has pointed out our uh, just a minute yeah john samuel sir has pointed out uh, he tried to bring in the dichotomy that actually certain times actually we have done better and uh, we cannot always claim that actually we have done really very good kerala has done very really very good but we have to keep in mind kerala is a state okay so till march or june kerala could be able to do whatever is the best but when the state is not receiving the required support from the center okay so that's where actually from the june from actually march and either when i try to actually work on the paper i understood that when it comes to social security measure kerala is the first state which try to provide certain money to the my actually the unorganized sector labor or in terms of food rations to the people okay but they try to contain it to the maximum best till june and almost during the june the curve has become flattened but when they required additional support in terms of monetary because the extra the remittance money is not coming but there is no support actually they have received from outside so ultimately they have to open up all the sector because otherwise the livelihood livelihood is getting affected the people cannot be actually die of hunger okay you you are trying to save them from covid but you cannot let them to die of hunger so somebody you have to try to find some actually middle path so that is where i felt actually the kerala has actually opened up the sectors and which led to increase in terms of the cases after actually june july that's where the curve was actually raised and when it comes to the actually the satyan's presentation uh, the one thing which i which came to my mind is that they were doing some work with anganwadi and they were providing some food but my question is that rather than they providing the food anganwadi as an institution has been constituted in terms of providing the supplementary nutrition for the children adolescent girls and adolescent girls in what ways actually action aid could have worked in terms of reviving it or because uh, during the covid 19 the first wave when the continuous lockdown for 3 months was happening nearly around some actually 2 months the people did not get any actually food rations because the, the, they could not able to transport the food rations so ngo either the international organizations institutions working on uh, rights okay what kind of role they can play in terms of actually negotiating with the government to continue the food provision should be a major aspect rather than they providing food to the people because there is an existing institution there is a food ration available with the fca they should try to actually do this aspect i believe uh, so this is, is actually the other common we think of yes sir yes sir uh, dilip uh, i think we have to move to the next speaker because we are running out of time uh, okay, we are okay, okay, next... okay. there is any comment i will just raise it later sir yes yeah. thank you sir later we can do because we have to we have no time yeah, now yes, and uh, tata sri yeah, yes, tata sri nath uh hello am i audible yeah 3 minutes for you uh, yeah. uh first of all thank you in pre for uh, contacting me i'll just move into my comments uh, directly i basically have four comments to me uh well uh, starting from the points that we have already we have discussed a lot on the uh, aspect of where the local self government and the local groups were able to make well i think one of the major aspect that has made them ready to serve was the point where it was a bane that come you know that has turned into boon because kerala in that matter before corona we were affected by nipa and the two floods where again it was these people were in a sense were ready to work or that uh, that exercises has given them that uh, you know the experience to go forward with the corona aspect and i think that is where again that uh, you know our our own uh, success also stays because uh, what happened from the first the corona, the first surge and to the second surge is the first surge it was more of a there was not a position of uh, uh, of of uh, community spread happening as that of the second surge and therefore it was more of a contact tracing and everything 
to which we were very much experienced and we were more into a very uh, proactive mode rather than the defensive situation but now when it came to the defensive situation we are in a curve, you know in our own learning curve and that is what i feel that has happened so uh, i'll also continuing on that point i think all these has led to a position where there is a rise of sub nationalism coming up in kerala which has given a more of community sense to the people and that has actually given an added boost to the uh, to the be it to the bureaucrats or to the society and the civil society participant itself where they see a failure of kerala to be a failure of themselves and that has actually uh, yeah, and it is a double edged sword in that manner as uh, as uh, rightly pointed out by john samuel this has led into a more of a self congratulatory mode where we have become a very blinded to many of the uh, part of the failure that has happened uh and uh, coming to the next point uh, one another aspect of kerala which i think is very important and probably could uh, you know is the real kerala model that it's the investment that has gone into the stem education in kerala which has led to the whole society not only so in every family there is at least one person who knows how to use the digital technologies and the digital embrace and understanding the same there is a digital embrace that has come from the government side and uh, a centralized uh monitoring through the digital infrastructure has given a vision and a motive or uh, have given a proper direction for the uh, local uh, for the local or the uh, for the street level bureaucrats to work properly and uh, but to that point i think we have failed in the um, uh, in the place of education again because uh when we were going or when we were looking into more into uh, the uh, the corona side that, that there is a social failure that is keeping on happening and i think uh, that is again a, a major reason of the long marathon approach that we have taken where we have delayed the curve the peak of the curve to the second surge so this is really a double say, double edged sword because we can see a falling of a rural economy while the urban economy uh, as uh, uh, as uh, earlier professor had said that you know even though kerala could be seen as one big city but still there is a real rural community that exists within these cities and that gap has been quite wi uh, quite widening and we all know of the stories where uh, a child had committed suicide and uh, all those situations so this uh, so there is uh, even in your part and there was a case of covid there and a new age untouchability that has been formed uh, so even when we claim on so much of the literacy and everything but there is a certain social uh, i think again that is a problem of the sub nationalism uh, idea that is growing within kerala where it is becoming very difficult for us to accept that you know something is happening and something wrong is happening and there is that community push over to uh, uh, to the people who they are not able to manage within their own uh, system uh again uh, so uh, these are my quick comments that i would like to make um, again uh, uh, i'll stop over here thank you thank you thank you dr srinath i think uh, uh, dr dilip has talked about the two month gap where there was nothing uh, coordination between state and central government and you spoke about the what is called the long term investment kerala made on education and health probably help you said about every household that somebody who can uh, you know look at the digital literacy and we have two more speaker uh, can we have arun please arun for uh, two two minutes arun are you there arun are you there yeah yeah i'm here i'm here you can, can, you can have your comment for two or three minutes yeah then we'll go to esther yeah i just comments. want to i just want to add a uh, make a brief point okay. that when we compare kerala's statistics with the numbers from other states you have to understand that our numbers are probably more reflective of the reality than the numbers say about up or madhya pradesh or other states when we say that these are the number of people who are infected probably that is uh, correct whereas actually people have no clue how many people are falling sick or how many people are actually dying uh, in other part of the country only when the next census takes place and you have a, an idea about excess death We we actually know the uh, COVID tally in other states. I think in Kerala we are likely to capture it uh, more in real time. I think uh, that kind of uh, perspective we must have. Otherwise, I mean, uh, there is only one point I want to make. Thank you, Arun. Okay. I think you. I think Arun, you made a very important point. I think that's very very important for us because you are right because the database, the quality of data, and the actual reporting. Because many times people say India is under reporting, maybe two to three times. the number of deaths but i think i think kerala may be the reporting i think reporting also probably uh, something uh, we have to look at it 
Uh, and we'll have, uh, you want to say anything more, uh, Arun, or I will ask Esther to have some few uh, points? No, no, that's it. Please go on. Okay. Uh, Esther, please. Esther, would you like to say anything, Esther, for uh, two minutes? Uh, uh, well, uh, I'm extremely um, grateful for this opportunity. Um, given our uh, limited experience, uh, uh, actually, my colleague, um, uh, Satyan has uh, actually um, mentioned about the kind of work that we've been doing and um, uh, no matter what, I mean, I fully agree with uh, what Dr. John Samuel has actually said, um, no matter whatever it is, like in fact, like in Tamil Nadu yesterday, we had this uh, uh, NGO coordination meeting with the uh, uh, Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu. And um, there again, I did mention about the effective model of how uh, we can, um, by aligning with the Panjait uh, Raj system, or like how well we could respond to this whole situation. So that is the lesson for everyone to take up. And the new challenge that we have faced with this uh, COVID is like the stigma and discrimination, which is actually um, high in highly prevalent. It is unlike the HIV because we, we did work in the HIV context where, where um, uh, the stigma and discrimination was high. But here uh, what happens is like um, uh, cut across everyone, you know, like um, uh, they, they do uh, get this by just um, mere contact, they um, get this virus and here the stigma and discrimination uh, is quite high and that itself is a cause for uh, spread of this uh, virus. So probably that is one area like we need to, of course, the challenge that we have with regard to uh, vaccination awareness and all the thing, but uh, the stigma and discrimination irrespective of whether it's Kerala, Tamil Nadu, whatever the state, that should be given a high priority. That is what uh, my humble submission for this forum for this part. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, thank you, Esther. I think that's very important because uh, last uh, wave probably, uh, you know, that the migrants were branded as the carrier of COVID-19. So I think that stigma, I think already somebody spoke about stigma. I think I think something we should look at it, how we can avoid it. Because it can be, as, as uh, our chair rightly said, the COVID can go anywhere because one of the things I was telling in many meetings is that COVID is not discriminatory, but we are discriminatory. COVID can go to any place because it has no, it has no discrimination. But when, when people, we are discriminated, we say this belongs to my caste, my village, my, my, my religion or my political party, but COVID has nothing. COVID goes to all political party leaders because we have seen it gone to the co minister's house of India and it went to the superstar of, uh, you know, Amitabh Bachchan. So it goes everywhere. You don't care you have money or not, but we are discriminated. I think we can, all of us can get one lesson from COVID-19 wave one and wave two is that please don't discriminate like COVID-19. It never discriminates people. I think that is something we should learn from the COVID-19. And uh, Arjun, we are running out of time, so I will uh, ask Chair to uh, give her uh, a closing remark, because I can give every a speaker to speak for a, a, maybe a minute each, uh, whatever you people think, because we are already 90 minutes completed. Right, right, sir. So uh, can, I, can I ask the Chair to uh, give you a final word? Yes, sir, why not? And sir, okay. I also have a few questions uh, also to you. <laughs> Okay. But let, let Haran ma'am make uh, remarks and yeah. ma'am, please feel free to ask questions to any of our panelists or some suggest or comment as you deem yeah. it. Because, you know, I thought, you know, we are, we are already 90, 90, 95 minutes, so. <laughs> Time, okay. no problem, but yes, also, we should also wind up, everyone is. Yes. <laughs> okay, and Dr. Navida, please. Now you are learned everything, so you can give now good, good speech. <laughs> you are not <laughs> no, for everyone. I I have no intention to give, to give a speech, but uh, I want to share some ideas and some comments that I have. Uh, you know, uh, being having lived in Kerala most of my life and then now based in Delhi and watching Kerala from outside as Mr. John Samuel was also mentioning is, is a different thing altogether. And my heart really goes out and I'm out. I feel restless because I'm out of administration now and I can't do anything there. Of course, I started doing here but then that's a different issue. Kerala is home. Uh, but then what still confuses me and I want to salute and I want to reply to that is that Kerala has the best healthcare in infrastructure. Nobody knows it better than Dr. Rajan. Vaccination system was going well. Uh, there was no shortage of oxygen. 
it has a very good network of doctors and uh, social deliverers, ASHA workers, um, uh, Kudumbashri, uh, youth organizations, all these are there. And yet we had the second wave in spite of that. And then in addition to that, we have the sense of social solidarity of helping neighbors each other, which is not there in Mumbai or in Delhi. Where I live, it's, it's difficult, but uh, you have it in Kerala. In spite of that, we got that. And listening to all of you, I have one comment, which, uh, which may not sound very apt, but I feel that's the conclusion I can draw, that the second wave was almost brought about by a suicidal mentality. Challenging the, the virus, you can't do anything. I go, I'll go after you. But then the, the virus won. And therefore we got all these infections and we are getting the mortality. Now, I don't think we need to gloat on the fact that the mortality cap per, capita is less, per capita is less in Kerala, because I would have expected Kerala to be much, much better. Administration is so much better. And I'm proud of the fact that I was a part of it. Therefore, it pains me. Now, I think what also has happened is that in the first phase, uh, and I'm happy that Dr. Rajan was a part of it, and he will probably be able to corroborate what I say. Um, the guidelines and the SOPs and the, and the lockdown directions issued, the government meant business. Whereas what happened thereafter, end of 20s, 2020, and now in 2021, it all seems very, seemed very half-hearted. Karna hai to karo, nahi to nahi karo. It was almost as if telling the people that it's your, it's your life. You go and do what you want. That doesn't work in a, in a, in a, uh, when you're doing public health. That's not the way. You can't have the shopping malls in Ernakulam functioning and then say that it's for the people to decide whether they want to come or not. That's not the way to have done it. So I think that was the, the, the major mistake that I found. The second thing, uh, decentralization and decentralization, decentralized governance is the plus point of Kerala, no doubt. But when it comes to policy, when it comes to uh, making health services available, it has to come from the state level. And that came. And I was so happy to hear Sriram say two things, which I've been hearing uh, from the other uh, colleagues of mine from Kerala who have been, uh, whom I have been talking to, what they call these one lakh beds they have set up, uh, which are outside hospitals, which are only for the, the patients who have been suspected to be COVID positive are kept there, screened. If they are positive, they are, they are made to either go home if they are going home worthy, or they are made to stay there and taken care of without affecting the hospital system. This is something that I think UP Bihar have to learn. This, this, is a, this is a practice which I think uh, we have to spread it. Um, and I, I'm especially referring to Dr. Arjun. This is a practice which should go to all the states because the biggest problem that has happened in UP Bihar, the Northern states and many of the, of the other states has been the, the not so well um, infrastructured, health infrastructure states has been the, 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 uh, the pressure on the hospitals, the health system on the doctors. That did not happen in Kerala. And this is something very positive. The second thing that should be learned is the, the, uh, the, the role performed by the, the non-state actors. You know, it's in Kerala, uh, you don't find the people complaining that government hasn't done this, government hasn't done that. They may say it, but they would go out and do something which often does not happen in some of the other states. And that is something to be learned. And that is how the SHGs and Kudumushri has come up. And I have worked with them very closely and therefore I know they don't depend on the government. They do their work. If the government assistance comes very well. The other thing I want to mention and highlight is the migrant workers, the status of the migrant workers. And I don't think there's anyone uh, to speak better on that and more, um, a more erudite speaker than uh, Professor Rajan. But I want to add here that something that needs to be done is the pandemic has drawn attention to the fact that migrants, migrant workers, internal migrant workers are there for good. 
you cannot do without it. The source state cannot do without it. The host state cannot do without it. It controls, somebody said, 40% of India's economy is controlled through migrant populations. If that is so, we have to put our attention to it. And in Kerala especially, it, the attention has to be given to them. Come, some of the things that one has to keep in mind is for a migrant worker, you not only have to think of the worker who's working there, but you have to think of the family that is back home. They survive on what this man sends back. And therefore, if this man is not able to earn and send back anything, this family, either in Bihar or Bengal or Assam, is in dire straits. And therefore, we have to find some way in which either the source state or the host state takes care of it. Why doesn't Bengal have a system for giving free ration to these families whose uh, earning members are in Kerala? They haven't done that, but why not? I think, that, I think Kerala has to take up these ideas and bring it to their notice. The second point is that the personal income uh, is of course important for these migrant workers, but one has to also understand, and for that one has to go to places like Perumbabur to understand that the entire economy of that panchayat runs on migrant workers now, whether it is the shops, the petty trade, the auto workers, the bus system, everything is dependent on the migrant workers because there'll be no earning for many of these people, including the vegetable vendor, the fruit vendor, all these people. And therefore one has to make sure that these migrant workers are taken care of and they, their interest is protected. The other thing I want to mention is about data. I think this is something that's which the states and uh, are not doing. And I know they are not doing, and I guess uh, it is uh, uh, impossible to ask for from states like UP or Bihar, but in Kerala, it is possible. Good scientific data collected is extremely important. And it is especially important vis-a-vis -vis Kerala because Kerala has a different profile of population. We have an aging population there. It doesn't have the, the young population of these other states. And therefore, the impact of COVID-19 on Kerala will probably be much different from what it is on states like Bihar and UP. And therefore, the data collection of the people impacted, people infected, the recovered people, the, the, the people, the fatalities, the family members, I think that data will be extremely important in future and that data should be collected. And I think our scientists and uh, the, the, uh, the faculties who are present here today should take this up as, as, as something that will need to be done in the future. Because not only will it be important for a third or fourth wave, God forbid there is one, I hope there isn't any, but if there is one, it will also be important for posterity. Because uh, you know how we struggle to think of uh, what the data has come from 100 years ago pandemic. We, hardly have much data. For India, in fact, almost nothing. Therefore, we need good scientific data. And finally, I want to mention something that uh, I think one of the speakers had mentioned. I think Kerala can do much better than the other states because the attitude of the administrators and the workers there is different from that in other places. You find that empathy in Kerala amongst even the IAS officers and the Tasildas, every level, which you will not find, I do not find even in a, in a place like Greater Noida or a, um, Ghaziabad or Gurgaon, which are almost urbanized as good as Delhi, but you don't find it there. So I think we should build on that empathy. That is so important in, in times of stress like this, where we reach out to the people, whether it is the elected representatives or the non-state actors, everyone has that sense of empathy when they work in Kerala. And I, th I think that is very important and that is something that we need to highlight and learn from. I was very happy to learn, listen to all these, uh, all the speakers today. And uh, I don't think I have much to share. I have my confusion. I'm recovering from COVID. And uh, as I said, I, I get, sometimes I get very restless. I feel I need to do something. I have started doing a lot of things here. But my heart always remains for Kerala. And therefore, my heart bleeds when I see that uh, being mentioned as the highest infection rate 
No, we don't want that for Kerala. Kerala is much too good for that. And therefore, let's all work together and bring it down. Thank you, Professor Rajan, and thank you, Professor Arjun. Thank you. Thank you, I, thank you uh, our chair. I think you have completely covered what other people spoke. I just wanted, to, before I hand over to Arjun, I just want to make a, a one, one statement. Basically, what happened the first wave, after the December, I think Kerala was in the election mode. I think the election mode is probably, I think that has completely derailed what we achieved in wave one. I think this is something which I see it right now, based on my experience as a COVID committee member of the first wave. And the second point is that, you know, in the first wave, we were talking, uh, you know, throughout the country, we were talking between life and livelihoods in the first wave, because that's why we had a lot of migration issues. Yeah, there was no life at the time. We were all talking about livelihoods. But the second wave, everything moved to life. We are talking about no oxygen, no hospital bed. So the migrant issue is completely gone back. Right? So the livelihood has gone back. Now we are talking about life. How to People are dying. So we will never talk about dying in the wave one. We were talking about people on the road. There is no, you know, there is no, nothing is there. So I think the second wave has completely shadowed the livelihood. I think Vinod brought it very clearly. I think we were now talking about death. Everybody telling in my village, in my area, people are dying. See, I don't think we were discussed about death, life itself in the during COVID one. I think that also have our outlook has been changed. I think we have to come back because livelihood is as much important as lives. For many poor people, especially the middle class, you know, poor class, I think, you know, you can give them raisin, raisin rice, but how long? And they have some other things to do. It is not such that they live on only the food because they have saving, their, their family functions are being postponed, marriage is being postponed. I think it's something we should, uh, we should, we, we should definitely look at it. I think we have opened up a lot of ideas. I think uh, I will hand over to Dr. Arjun to say the final. Thank you. Thank you for everything. I think we had a... Very interesting, and especially because the, of the presence by Sri Ram, and the government, uh, you know, it has created basically a lot of interest in the, in the, in the subject. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you also, sir, for also encouraging me to be after him. <laughs> I was really, and tried all my best to, you know, uh, all that. But, sir, I, I really wanted to have, uh, uh, to learn from all of you a few questions. Uh, I'll, I'll come I'll ask a few questions to you only first. Uh, sir, last year you have always highlighted the issue of international migration, Vande Bharat mission, and those who are coming from Gulf countries, their salaries stopped for two months, three months. And uh, uh, I would see uh, Rajan sir saying in all the platforms, someone should do something about it. And everything sir also suggested me that uh, we uh, have something on that, some discussion. I tried my hand uh, over that, but uh, now sir is with a new organization. I hope we can jointly learn in that issue. How do you see that scenario now, sir? Especially in the second wave and, and going forward. Uh, added to that question, I would also add, uh, how do you see the tourism economy of Kerala now? Uh, because that will, uh, going ahead this year is looking to be very, you know, uh, uh, we don't know how, what is going to happen next. So these were two questions which I wanted to ask you. I Then I have one question for, uh, for Dr. Haran that ma'am, you rightly said that the attitude uh, in Kerala uh, becomes different when, when it comes to uh, even laborers or administrators. Uh, uh, what can be done to instill that attitude, especially in our northern part of the country? Uh, we see uh, especially the homogeneity of the states, for example, Mizoram or others, uh, that, that is entirely different thing. When we uh, uh, had the talk in Bihar, Jharkhand, and uh, UP, other places, their experts are saying that the Jhola Chhap doctors are God. North is the situation, their problem is there are quacks. Uh, you see the, the kind of differences India has. So how do you see we can instill that kind of uh, attitudinal change or behavioral change? In fact, uh, the, all the policies we work with, uh, uh, and international people come and say that behavior change is most important for all the schemes, all the policies. So many a times I feel that we should have a ministry of behavioral change, uh, especially attached to the PMO, of course. Uh, but that was one question to you. I, I also have one question to TK Arun, sir. Sir has been writing a lot about vaccination. Sir, what do you see the way forward for Kerala in the vaccine shortages? Uh, should state government move forward and uh, procure its own, you know, Atnirbhar Kerala. And uh, what, what, how do you see the way forward? 
So, Vinod sir, I wanted to ask that Chhattisgarh have Nyay Yojana, the UBI uh, income transfer. Uh, what do you see this kind of scenario in Kerala? Uh, and uh, what kind of amount and other things do you see the new state government can have to support uh, economically weaker section in the state? That there are of course many things taking place, but uh, you give uh, you give dry ration or other things. That's okay. Uh, but uh, uh, and our uh, our government gave uh, uh, 500 500 through Jantan, but the amount was very less. Do you see, see any scope of Kerala experimenting with uh, universal basic income or that kind of transfer going forward in terms of uh, a governance? And uh, uh, my question also to Reni sir was that uh, what do you see that in the in the southern states how Kerala is faring, especially in dealing with the second wave. Uh, vis a vis the neighboring states, Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. Uh, the situation in Tamil Nadu is a bit different. And how do you see th this, uh, this uh, 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 thing going on? Uh, with John, sir, I would like to uh, really ask, sir, since sir has international experiences, that uh, which country uh, Kerala should uh, look forward to, given what Kerala has achieved and what, where it is. Uh, do you have any international practices, if sir, you know? Uh, that uh, that Kerala should emulate, be it South, uh, Southeast Asian country or others. So uh, I'll have th these few comments to uh, to see. Uh, Dilip sir also, I wanted to ask that since uh, sir is uh, you know teaching social work there, how do you see the the response of the citizens and and the uh, at large uh, and also local people coming forward uh, to tackle this uh, uh, crisis. So uh, with that, I, I would also request all of you to also incorporate this or uh, any question or comments you seem fit and have your remarks uh, 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 with the way forward also. also uh, please incorporate that also. So should we go one by one? Uh, I don't know uh, if, you have, if you have time. And uh, uh, you know I don't want to give uh, so much uh, talk on migration because return migration requires a particular another seminar because we have received 12 lakhs people have come back uh, to Kerala, people are saying, and it, throughout the country, we have 20 lakhs. So the return migrant is not such a Kerala's problem. Of course, Kerala has more return migrants. I think that is something we should look at it very carefully. We have done some surveys, and the reports are slowly coming up. Maybe I'll be speaking on another conference in another maybe month time. Maybe we can do it together so that your audience also can listen to us, which will be like a one person talking. You know, I will be giving a seminar on uh, my study, which I was just completed. You know, like it's not a uh, you know, it's not like you have, you know, five, six people talking. There will be one person will be talking for 30 minutes on the full study, and then there can be one discussion, then it is open to the public, you know, something like that. So maybe you can partner with us on the return migration study, which we are just completing in another month's time. So that, that, include, thing, yeah, yeah. That, that also include international migrants? Yeah, there's only but international but migrants. Yeah, yeah international okay. migrants, not internal migration. And the second point, what Vinoj has already made is that uh, in Kerala, the, 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 the tourism is also affected. He's right. So I think uh, uh, that is something, even the tourism is also, there are more people uh, working in the internal migrants are working in the tourism sector. So it has also have to something to do with the internal migrants. So I think internal migrants has to be re looked at it carefully because though we have reasonably good data, I will not say we have the best data for international migration, but we have re not really good data on internal migration. So I think also we should look at the good database, you know, on looking at both internal and international because that is like a matching ground. See, like what I call them replacement migration. Kerala plumber is in Dubai, we are getting plumber from Orissa. It's a very simple thing. You know, uh, Dr. Nivida is in Delhi, I am in Kerala. So that's it. So I don't belong to Kerala, she belongs to Kerala. So I am migrated from other state to help Kerala and she is helping Delhi. So it's like, it's like a replacement, just a replacement. So, but the replacement should be very perfect replacement. Otherwise, I am treated badly in Dubai, and uh, the other worker coming in West Bengal treated badly in Kerala. The same thing. So I think I think that is something we should really look at it. I think the migration requires a very important discussion. I think not just for today. As I said earlier, livelihood is going to be affected for a long time. Livelihood. See, somebody dies, the matter ends there. Life is over. But livelihood is a long-term thing. And people, even I was told now because I'm a demographer, people who were affected by COVID is likely to live probably less than 10 years. Some studies have started coming in compared to the people who are not affected. For example, now we have a group of people, COVID affected, COVID not affected in our society. They had experienced COVID at their lifetime. Maybe the age of 34, 
54, 74. Suppose an average Malayali after reaching 60 lives 20 years. Now I have to calculate after reaching 60, somebody had COVID. Maybe COVID person might live only 17 years. Without COVID, can I make them to live 20? So that is that we additional work people have to do because like we talk about quality of life. The quality of life may be different for the people who had uh, COVID experience, especially for the elderly people. Because Kerala has, an, uh, you know, I, almost uh, I was talking to somebody three days back. One out of six person in Kerala is a old person. One out of six, and this is almost like Italy, but we are not seeing the deaths like Italy anyway. So, so I think now we maybe we have postponed the deaths. That's what somebody told me during the floods. You know, in Kerala during the floods, less people died. But after the flood of three months, many people died. But they are not called uh, uh, related to flood deaths because you, you count it. Today there is accident. People say five people died, and the paper talks about every day five people died. There is an accident. But after four days, five days, uh, more people dying. That that is not come as an important document. That's been given the floods after that in Kerala. There are many people. In fact, one of the church priest told me after the flood. Because everybody will be buried in the church. That they have a register. Anybody dying in the church. So they said. Compared to last year, 2019, same period, 2020, there were more deaths in my parish after the floods. But you know, you should get into those type of you know clinical and practical database. Then only we will be able to answer because I don't think we have solved problem. We have we have more uh, questions than answers. Are we postponed the deaths? I think this is very important thing. I'm surprised now. Maybe post COVID, for example, post COVID death in Kerala is much higher. post covid death in india is much guy the second wave come back to the first wave post covid now post covid we talk about only say and they are dying but they are not reported as a covid death because they have already out of the covid you see so now that mean covid is already impacting the lives of the people because of the covid post covid death even in delhi post covid deaths are much higher they have survived came back home all right after three days they are again taken to hospital You know, I think I think something we should look at. It's like a lot of medical, but I am doing some work with Sri Ram. We are writing some paper. That's why when I told Arjun, you know, did you call him? Because uh, you know, we have written a paper now looking at the uh, you know the age curve of Kerala. You know the age, you know age pattern. You know, our Kerala had more deaths compared to the standardized. You know, if you have the same aging population, what is the death rate you expect? Is Kerala has reduced it? Because Kerala anyway definitely have high morbidity compared to many states. high morbidity of course i don't need to tell uh, dr haran you know that high morbidity in kerala you know because i was i was doing a aging survey in kerala in the age 70 you have 28 to 30 percent people in kerala living with three multiple diseases three multiple diseases if you meet a person in kerala with 70 years the chance he is having three multiple diseases will be there and then somebody will have two multiple diseases and taking medicine until they die it's like a chronic disease And then one multiple disease. That means you have when you reach 60, either you have one multiple disease, or two multiple disease, or three multiple diseases. Now those people had COVID, and then they might have recovered. And like what John was telling, 46, 53, 54. Now this time it has even come to the less than 60 age group. So I think we should uh, we should learn from the data what we have to generate, and the data should be genuine for us to interpret the findings. i'm going to stop here i can go on talking but i am stop here and maybe others can have their own comments and we'll start with probably john i can see john right now john you can have any comments based on the question arjun sir maybe a minute so we'll have so, everybody a minute or two then we'll wind up no no i i just wanted to say you know as far as covid is concerned international comparison is very difficult because what happened is the context matters a lot because it's a it's a context specific thing i can say you know say new zealand did it very well new zealand is an island state you know its its dynamics is very different its population density is very different germany is doing very well actually germany and italy managed to contain the second uh, uh, wave kerala i always said you know i wrote an article in last uh, year that we are winning the battle and losing the war so we won the battle and actually we lost the war and that is you know not to the government our political class i mean i would say that uh, you know this you know all the gains which we made in 3 months 
you know, with so much of, uh, I mean, I was actively involved in election, but I kept a distance. I kept the, you know, sort of uh, mask, but still it was not an easy thing. And I had to tell again, use the mask, use the mask, use the mask. So uh, this overconfidence, self-congratulatory self overconfidence is the one which we, we, we lost it. In terms of comparison, I must say, uh, Germany is a good example. German has, you know, one is it is a very localized lockout. It's a very interesting thing. Now, Berlin yesterday has opened up some places. So they have very clear criteria set up during the lockdown. It's not the entire country is not locked down. Because that will have a huge economic implications. So even in Kerala, in the second phase, we try to do it. Because we cannot do the entire state lockdown. Because it is going to kill the livelihood of so many people. And uh, people are going to die out of, you know, you cannot uh, give kit to people every week. It's not practical. It's not done. You know, how, how much ever we wish to do it. And the biggest thing I would say, unlike other things, Kerala is a derivative economy. It's a service sector economy, 67%. So, and that is where the big hit, the new government is going to face the biggest crisis Kerala is going to face along with this epidemic is the financial, uh, you know, public finance crisis and economic crisis. So we have a whole new strategy, uh, which is not comparable to any other country, to be honest. And, uh, and actually in India, each state will have to develop its own strategy because this is an unprecedented situation after 100 years, you know. Even Spanish flu was a very different thing. Cholera was a different thing. And this is a very unprecedented thing. So I don't think that international uh, comparison, we can have lessons learned from here and there about, uh, you know, lockdown, about the management. But we cannot export it uh, or import it fully because we need to evolve our own strategies. That's my, uh, we need to have our own uh, policy measures, uh, you know, Kerala requires a completely new uh, perspective Honestly, uh, we cannot uh, go on like this. We need a fresh look and fresh way of handling this. As he said, there is going to be most post-COVID death. You know, the, the morbidity rate in Kerala is highest and mortality rate is less. But the morbidity rate will go up and the mortality rates also will go up. So Kerala's demography uh, requires a very, very, uh, very important relook. And we need a completely different policy perspective uh, on dealing with it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, Rani, you want to say anything, Rani? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm One minute. To, yes, <laughs> I, I'm asked to compare between the nearby states. So, uh, yes, uh, uh, in addition to the, the, uh, the strong health system and the convergence between departments, I would say decentralized governance, as you also have pointed out, that makes a difference in Kerala. Many nearby states, uh, the Panjai Raj system is not working at all. So that makes a real difference. And also voluntarism is another aspect. Uh, the empathy part also was highlighted. But I would say, if somebody is interested, can do a little research on whether the, the ideological base of Kerala is in a way contributing to this empathy part that I am leaving to the, to the audience like that. But then two, three things very important. One hundred percent vaccination for Kerala. The central government should have the priorities set right, so that the states will get its share, including Kerala. The allotment of Kerala from the central government is over today. And uh, I would say that uh, uh, the livelihood opportunities or MNREGA should be converted to more like livelihood opportunities in the days to come. In my presentation, I shared one case of one Sunil. He's a mechanic. And I want to tell you that it will take uh, three months more for him to recover well and come back to work. So I would suggest that vulnerable families should get a monthly uh, subsistence, monthly grant in the days to come, not only for the COVID uh, the positive people who are recovering, but I'm also talking about in future to, to get rid of the issue of human trafficking and uh, child labor and all those issues from the vulnerable communities, basically tribal and Dalit communities they may need some monthly grant to support them. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Thank you, Vinod. Uh, Vinod, you would like to make any comment, Vinod? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, quickly, two things. Uh, firstly, uh, before I the question that was asked to me, just uh, to add to the thing about the second wave. I mean, uh, we have put our most of our attention regarding elections. Elections certainly added uh, to the kind of rise. But one of the other things is about the new variants that are coming in. So the, the way in which it is spreading and the ineffectiveness of even the vaccine, I think that has also had a very important role in the way in which the second wave is spreading. So the second wave is not specific to Kerala. It, is, uh, it, is, uh, it has gone across the world. It is not specific to Kerala, not India. It is uh, across the world it has happened. And uh, so, I mean, uh, election plays certainly a role, the way in which it has spread. But then I think so there is something more than the election also. So we should consider something, there is something beyond the election that we should be worried about. Probably one of it is about the variants, the new new variants, but we don't know actually the exact reasons about that. That's about the second wave. And also people considering themselves as life as normal. I mean, uh, having the first wave gone, people were thinking that, okay, let us get back to the, nor the, the old normal. They are earning to go back to their normal. So, Yes, uh, we should have been much, much more careful, but uh, we, we can't blame people also that uh, people have gone out and thought that they could live their lives back to what it was earlier. Maybe, yes, much more careful we should be. That is the second thing. The, the question that was, that was uh, raised to me by Dr. Arjun with regard to the income transfer, I think the answers have already been made by uh, Dr. John as well as uh, Dr. Reni, uh, Mr. Reni over there. I mean, the financial condition of the state is something that we need to be looking at. I mean, Kerala, uh, already we are in very, very, very big uh, financial trouble, actually. I mean, if you look at the finances of the state government right now, even before the COVID, I mean, it, it is not uh, something that COVID had to do anything with it. I mean, COVID had only exacerbated it, but the, the financial situation of the state is such that I don't think the Kerala government has the capacity to take any more load on uh, welfare uh, distribution of it. But having said this, as Kerala being a welfare state, it's a responsibility you cannot shed away from. And I think, and I think the Kerala government of Kerala had taken up the issue of kit distribution kit kit But what uh, Mr. Reni has raised, I think, is a wonderful suggestion, and that, that that can be targeted, targeted to certain households which has been affected by COVID, poor uh, those who have been affected by COVID, firstly who have who have had uh, issues either the death in the family or who had prolonged diseases in the families, especially among the poor, the government of Kerala must actually target them in terms of, apart from the uh, tips that is being distributed, there should be an income support because there is not going to be any earnings to these households or, or much reduced earnings. But these are not the only affected, uh, affected households, as we know, as I was telling earlier, international migrants, internal migrants, these households who have lost their jobs, all of them are under their uh, dire straits and they all need support, but I don't think a government uh, can support, especially a, a government. I had said some uh, to some of my friends, I keep telling this in Kerala is a poor state with rich people. So the government of Kerala is poor, but the people of Kerala, uh, to a large extent, if you look at because of the remittances and other sources of income, that they, they seem to be quite, quite well off. Access. Now, there is a segment of Kerala within Kerala which requires support, and the government of Kerala should be able to support them both in terms of kind as well as in cash and some amount i can't say what what amount it would be but some amount in terms of monetary transfer itself would be required at least for those who have been directly affected by COVID among the poor i'll stop here thank you very much thank you thank you vinoj anyone i missed it or i will uh, give it to chair finally uh, ma'am is saying that she's not able to join but uh, take uh, his sir, yeah. Yeah. Take care of himself on vaccination. Yeah. Yes, Dilip, yeah. sir, I come to you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Arjun, for the Hello. Dilip, yeah. No, this is uh, T.K. Arun here. Could I just make two brief points? Yes, T.K. Yeah. Yes. On yeah. vaccination, yes. So on vaccination, uh, there is a global shortage of vaccine. Just by placing a global tender, nobody is going to get vaccine. You could see that the European Union is unable to procure enough vaccines to complete its vaccination program. Australia and New Zealand have been able to get their vaccines. The level of vaccination within China is still very primitive. So, uh, without increasing the production and supply of vaccines within India, Kerala will not be able to get their vaccines. So, this whole policy on vaccine supplies by the government of India right now is uh, completely messy. They created a three-tier pricing structure, I think, essentially to 
cost subsidize the central procurement it is a very ridiculous uh, system of making states compete with one another to buy vaccines uh, from within the domestic market or the global market so this has to be overhauled and that's a separate issue but we'll just have to get the vaccines i mean uh, uh, that we are able to uh, get but i just want to make one point kerala with all its uh, development achievements needs to have greater ambition somebody made this point about uh, having trained people in stem subjects why doesn't kerala have its own uh, biotechnology industry all these vaccines the greatest uh, uh, messenger rna vaccines and other uh, dna vaccines they all depend on advances in biotechnology which were originally intended to treat cancer now this is an opportunity for kerala to mobilize the diaspora across uh, the world and start little hubs where we can have a vibrant biotechnology industry and actually produce vaccines and cures or the cutting edge of technology the second ambition that kerala needs to have is with regard to migrant workers why doesn't kerala's political class try to organize the migrants who come to kerala the way the original uh, population of kerala working people of kerala were organized and empowered to become the the vibrant uh, civil society and enlightened conscious people that malayalis have become that organization needs to spread to other parts of the country as yes. at least we could start with organizing the migrant workers who come to kerala and so just merely exploiting them as cheap labor this is just the two thoughts i have thank you thank you arun thank you arun and uh, dr dilip you want to say a minute yes uh, yes sir yeah, yeah please ha uh, yeah Uh, thanks arjun for asking this question on the role of social work institution in disaster response or with related to uh, covid-19 pandemic see whenever we talk of actually social work response the response can be seen at either at the individual level or a group or local institution level or at a national level and usually the response becomes very effective when they feel responsible towards the fellow citizens and when they are having empathy that they have to do something okay so then this response become actually very uh, more appropriate and when this response is becomes actually institutionalized okay when they get a role in yeah, as part of the institu- institution then this becomes more concretized and as well as, uh, as well as it gives a very positive actually attitude and enforcement in terms of carrying out the work and especially if we take the case of kerala or tamil nadu in both the places actually the individuals or a group of actually people they have come together and the institution both the kerala government as well as the tamil nadu government they have given a full support and they positively uh, rewarded them and encouraged them to play a very active role and this, this has really built an actually very very strong support system along with the government institution to carry out a very good and appropriate work whenever that is required otherwise it becomes only the government institution have to do everything when individuals and groups and are, are coming forward and it is been supported by the government then this becomes an actually a, more ants join together and they can have a better, better fight in terms of tackling these kind of disasters and pandemics thank you thank you sir dilip arjun now we have to wind up Yes, yes yes sir now let me just quickly propose a vote of thanks and uh, nivetha ma'am has disconnected and uh, saying thanks to all the panelists and also saying uh, special thanks to uh, professor rajan for being a sterling moderator <laughs> so thanks from uh, nivetha ma'am to all of you so with that i would like to uh, propose a vote of thanks for this very important uh, uh, deliberation today a panel discussion on rural realities a practitioner's uh, perspective on tackling the second uh, surge of the coronavirus pandemic in indian villages uh, which was jointly organized by center for habitat urban and regional studies at uh, impre impact and policy research institute new delhi and the international institute of migration and development in kerala iamd uh, so i would like to thank all of our uh, uh, a panelist and participants today uh, uh, especially our chair uh, uh, dr nivedha p haran ma'am and our moderator thank you uh, irdia sir your support really gave so much of strength to take this further especially in this tough time and uh, really we are 
uh, very thankful for your kind motivation and personal motivation also to me to take this uh, forward. Uh, I would also like to thank all of our uh, panelists, uh, 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 Professor Vinod Abraham, Reni Jacob sir, uh, uh, Sri Ram Venkat Raman sir also joining from uh, the government. Thank you, uh, John Samuel sir, uh, Dr. Dilip Diwakar, uh, Sri Nath Nambudri sir, and T M Satyan sir. Uh, so with that, I would like to uh, thank all of our participants and those who will be watching this on uh, Facebook, YouTube, and our podcast later. And we all wish for a healthy and prosperous Kerala. With that, have a nice evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you so much for happening. Looking, you. Forward, looking forward for more collaboration. Thank yes, you, sir. Thank and you, your sir. guidance. Hi, thank you, thank you, Vinod. Thank you, sir. And happy birthday again, Vinod, sir. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Party is due. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arjun. Thank you. Good day, Rajan, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you also to uh, Esther, ma'am. I I forgot to thank. Thank you. Thank you.